capped off today by President Donald Trump taking stage in front of a small group of supporters, now with enough delegate votes to officially accept his party's nomination for a second term. Wasting no time. Trying to steal the election from the Republicans. President Trump going right after the Democrats, coming out of his corner swinging against former Vice President Joe Biden, claiming Biden's, quote, using COVID to steal the election, sowing even more doubt. The only way they can take this election away from us is if this is a rigged election. As the president's supporters, minus Kellyanne Conway, make their case in prime time tonight. President Trump promotes plasma therapy as a COVID-19 breakthrough, while there are questions about whether he pushed the FDA to approve its emergency use. Shot in the back, the city on edge tonight after the disturbing police shooting of a black man in Wisconsin. Jacob Blake shot from behind multiple times while reaching into a vehicle. One-two punch, tropical storm Marco hitting the Gulf Coast with tropical storm Laura right behind and gaining strength. Now targeting the same area as a possible hurricane. The alleged sex scandal involving one of the president's most vocal evangelical supporters, Jerry Falwell Jr., on his wife's affair, allegations of extortion, and the decision he just made public. And the first term, as the president looks ahead to a potential second term, we're looking back at the 45th president's accomplishments so far. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us for a president who believes size matters. It was a much smaller group than President Trump wanted as he accepted his party's nomination for re-election today in North Carolina. The lead up to this year's Republican National Convention has been challenging for the president with Biden ahead in the polls. One of his most trusted advisors, Kellyanne Conway, announcing she is stepping down from her role at the White House. And it has happened again. Another police-involved shooting, this time in Wisconsin, and it's sparking anger in another American city as Republicans prepare to have speakers who have challenged the Black Lives Matter movement tonight. Let's begin now with Jonathan Carl. He leads us off with more on the Republican convention now already underway. Pandemic? What pandemic? President Trump was greeted by a crowd of supporters in North Carolina today. No masks or social distancing, but plenty of enthusiasm for Trump. This has been a, a real love fest between North Carolina and Trump, right? It's been incredible. The president kicked off the Republican convention with a dark warning. This, this is the most important election in the history of our country. Yeah, it is. Don't let them take it away from you. Some 300 delegates gathered in Charlotte, the city that was supposed to hold the convention. But most of the speeches will be back in Washington, including at least seven speeches by members of the Trump family. And as the convention kicks off, Kellyanne Conway, one of the president's most fiercely loyal advisors, announced that she is stepping down to spend more time with her family. Our four children are teens and tweens starting a new academic year, Conway wrote in a statement. For now, and for my beloved children, it will be less drama and more mama. There's been no shortage of drama for the Conways. Her husband, George, has become one of the president's harshest critics. He announced he'll take a break from Twitter. The Republican convention plans have been curtailed due to COVID-19. But in some ways, the message is identical to the Trump message four years ago. We're going to make America great again. Again. The president is using his live appearances before crowds to draw a stark contrast with Joe Biden, who has rarely ventured outside of his home state since the pandemic hit. I felt an obligation to come to North Carolina. It's Joe Biden was going to have their convention in Milwaukee. And they didn't go there at all. They didn't do this. We did this out of respect for your state. David asked Biden about that in his first interview with running mate Kamala Harris. We saw the president just this week during the convention. He traveled to Pennsylvania. He traveled to Wisconsin, Iowa, Arizona, all of that while you were making your case to the American people. I understand the restrictions of COVID and campaigning in this time, but can you win a presidential election from home? We will. We're going to follow the science what the scientists tell us. We've been able to travel places when we've been able to do it in a way that we don't cause the congregation of large numbers of people. Look what happens, what, what's happened with his, his events. People die. People get together. They don't wear masks. They end up getting COVID. They end up dying. So when you hear the president say, this guy's afraid to leave his basement. Guess what? 
I have left my basement, and but here, in the meantime, 500 million people have watched what I've done out of my basement. And guess what? People are listening. People are listening. It's about being responsible. Jonathan Carl joins us now. So aside from the contrast with Biden that the president is already spelling out, what should we expect when it comes to the tone and the message of this convention that starts tonight? Well, the president has uh, said to expect uh, an optimistic and hopeful tone. That's also something we've heard uh, from his advisors who are organizing this convention. But i got to tell you, Lindsay, if you listen to the president's words so far in the lead up to this convention, uh, it doesn't sound uh, rather uh, optimistic or positive. He's, he's basically saying uh, that if Joe Biden were to win, it would mean the end of our country. Those are, those are literally the words uh, that he is using is it would be the end of the greatest country in the history of the world. He's also uh, has said, and he, he reiterated this again today, uh, that the only way he could lose is if the election is stolen from him. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess it, it depends on, on, on how you look at this. Uh, I guess the optimism is, uh, is that if he wins, he'll be able to uh, make America great again, again, as you heard uh, <laughs> Mike Pence say. Uh, but, but it's a very dark and ominous tone in terms terms of, uh, of what he thinks the Democrats have to offer. And what are the questions that have been raised about the venues where some of this week's speeches are taking place? Well, there are so many things uh, that we have seen over the past three and a half years where we say never before has X happened. This is really something. Um, we have uh, two of the signature speeches at this convention that will be taking place on White House grounds. The First Lady will be speaking from the newly refurbished Rose Garden at the White House, and Donald Trump will be giving his acceptance speech Thursday uh, at the South Lawn of the White House. Uh, now. As you know, um, there have always been sensitivities. Uh, there's a law called the Hatch Act that prohibits government employees uh, from doing overt campaign political work while they are on the clock. Uh, there's, there's, all, there's sensitivities about the use of government resources for overt political activities. But here you have two signature events uh, about the Trump campaign at the convention that will be taking place right there on White House grounds. And there's, a, there's another one, which is is uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is going to be addressing the speech, and he's actually on a trip. He's, he, he's going to be speaking from Jerusalem, where he is traveling as Secretary of State, and he's going to take a break from that trip. He's going to address uh, the convention live from Jerusalem. Uh, now, uh, what Pompeo has said is that there won't be any government resources used in the actual uh, you know, making and broadcasting of that speech, but again, more questions uh, being raised. He's on an official trip and he's giving an overtly, obviously overtly uh, political speech. Right, basic questions of separation of church and state here. All right, Jonathan Certainly. Carl, thanks so much. Joining us now, House Minority Whip Steve Scalise, who represents Louisiana. Thank you so much for joining us. Good to be with you, thanks. So tonight is of course the first night of the Republican convention. You're gonna be speaking there in just a little while. The theme tonight is land of promise. So what promises will you offer to the more than 55 million Americans who have now filed for unemployment since the pandemic began? Well, obviously you've seen President Trump working to get the economy back open again safely, to get schools reopened safely, so that we can recreate that great economy we had before COVID. Look, so many people were, were out, actually, anybody who wanted to find a job was able to get a job. There were more openings than there were people looking for work pre-COVID. Uh, we've got to get through this pandemic, but as we do, you're going to see this president better positioned to rebuild that economy again. Uh, Joe Biden in his 47 years in political office uh, never oversaw any kind of economy like what President Trump created in his first three years. So I think you're going to see a sharp contrast, uh, president with a good vision for how we can get our economy back on track, building on the successes and the promises he delivered for those forgotten men and women. Uh, that Washington had left behind for so long. As you're well aware, more than 175,000 Americans have lost their lives and counting, and more than 5 million have tested positive for COVID-19. No other country is close when it comes to death. So could more deaths have been prevented? And what grade would you give the Trump administration for its handling of the pandemic? Well, I just go by what Dr. Fauci said when he came and testified before our committee just about two weeks ago. He said literally President Trump on so many decisions from banning flights to China and Europe uh, to the things he, the steps he took to early off uh, shut down parts of the economy, 
Uh, President Trump made the right decision, and those decisions saved American lives. By the way, Joe Biden disagreed with those decisions when the president banned flights from China, for example. Joe Biden called that xenophobic. Dr. Fauci said President Trump's decision saved American lives. So, look, we've got to get through this pandemic. It's a worldwide pandemic, but we're also on the brink of a vaccine for the, probably the fastest we've seen in the history of modern medicine, where you can literally six months after a virus started potentially have a vaccine, two different drugs in stage three testing. FDA is moving at warp speed because of the president's direction to say, get red tape out of the way, don't cut corners. But look, over 250,000 Americans have signed up to be tested. And you've seen promising drugs like remdesivir approved as well. That all happened under President Trump's leadership. And look, we know this disease is out there, the virus is out there, but we're going to get through it. And we also know protocols how to safely get back to doing the things we did. And we've got to open our economy because people are dying right now uh, because they're shut in. Uh, kids that aren't getting immunizations, people that aren't getting their cancer treatments. Uh, we're seeing a dramatic increase in non-COVID deaths in other parts of our society because of the shut-in. And you, you've got to balance all of that. Congressman, I just want to follow up on that really quickly, because it has also been stated that if the president had reacted a week earlier, that would have saved tens of thousands of lives. If he had acted two weeks earlier, tens of thousands more. So are you concerned at all that he, for a lot, uh, in large part, in the beginning of the year, was really dismissing the coronavirus as a hoax? Well, first of all, I never said hoax in relation to that. But if you look early off, China was lying to the whole world. I was in a meeting in the White House with Dr. Fauci and others when our scientists were trying to get into China to find out what was going on in Wuhan. Their scientists wanted us, by the way. It was the Chinese Communist Party that said, we're not letting you in. And by the way, they were lying and corrupting the World Health Organization, saying it's not transmitted from human to human, which was a lie. If China would have acted quicker and been honest with us and the world, there would be uh, probably tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of worldwide deaths that would not have occurred. And that, by the way, China's got to be held accountable. We've seen Joe Biden's never been willing to hold China accountable on anything in his 47 years of service. You've seen Donald Trump being very aggressive at going after China. Uh, he's going after Russia. He's going after other countries. Look at Iran. You've got a deal with the United Arab Emirates right now and other Muslim countries that want to sign peace accords with Israel because of President Trump's leadership. He doesn't get credit for that, but that's the kind of work he does every day. The RNC has announced it will not release a party platform this time around. The Democrats ratified an 80-page list of priorities last week. In the past, party platforms have helped voters decide and spell out what each party hopes to accomplish if it gets to govern. What are Republicans' main goals if President Trump wins re-election? And how does the party plan to pitch itself to voters this week? Sure, the main goals are to keep Americans safe, to get through this COVID crisis, but also to rebuild the, the great economy we had prior to COVID. Uh, President Trump had built the hottest economy uh, in the history of our country. And by the way, it was working for everybody. The lowest unemployment ever for African Americans, for Hispanics. Women owned businesses were up like we've never seen before. We can get back to that. And, and who, who do you trust better to build it? The guy who had already built that great economy before? Or Joe Biden, who's embraced a far left agenda. Look, their platform, by the way, the Democrat platform mentions Donald Trump more times than it does jobs or racial equality. Uh, President Trump's agenda, by the way, is our platform, which is to focus on rebuilding our economy, creating more jobs, bringing jobs back from China, by the way, and keeping Americans safe, especially at home when you see some of these cities being torn up. Uh, where some of these folks on the left want to defund the police, which is a crazy idea. Uh, we're out of time, but I do want to just lastly get to this point uh, of the racial reckoning that's happening across the country. And of course, that new incident in Wisconsin that's sparking renewed fury today. Video appears to show a black man shot in the back multiple times in broad daylight by a white police officer. Tonight, Jacob Blake is in serious condition, and his name is added to a long list. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Elijah McClain. The St. Louis couple who stood in their front yards with assault rifle uh, as protesters walk by, they are going to be taking part in the RNC convention tonight. Are you worried about the optics of that? Well, first of all, you, you know, we, we all pray for uh, those that are recovering. George Floyd's death was a tragedy that I think everybody universally recognized should have never happened. And by the way, let's hold those people accountable who let the department run, in, the department run into disarray in Minneapolis. Uh, they, they allowed bad cops to exist. You can't tolerate bad cops, and good cops don't want bad cops either, by the way. So reforming law enforcement is something uh, that Donald Trump's laid out a plan to do. Joe Biden literally won't even address the violence in our streets right now because he literally said, quote, 
that he wants to reallocate money away from police. That's defunding police. That's not the answer. Congressman Scalise, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks. Great being with you. And with the convention kicking off in North Carolina tonight, we wanted to hear directly from voters in this critical swing state on how they're viewing the president's performance amid the pandemic. ABC's Martha Raddatz was on the ground talking to voters on both sides of the aisle and some who are still on the fence. On an afternoon thick with southern heat, Susan Ford expertly moves huge boxes of tobacco on her family's 2,000-acre farm leaving little time to pay attention to last week's Democratic convention, not that she wanted to. To me, it looks like he's, they're really, and the Democrats are really trying to push socialism in America. I'm not a big fan of that. Religion, her children's future, and farming are at the heart of Ford's solid support for Donald Trump. I think he's really done a lot for ag and agriculture in America. There is only one thing that gives her, well, pause about Trump. Do his tweets, some of the things he said, does any of that bother you? Um, to an extent it does, I'll have to say, but you know, he, he really doesn't have much support up there in Washington to, to back him up. Rural voters like Ford helped Trump carry this state in 2016. North Carolina very much reflects the urban-rural divide that is playing out in the country as a whole. Catawba College politics professor Michael Bitzer says what should concern Trump now is those suburban areas. He won the surrounding suburban areas very handily, over 60 percent. But if there's any slippage in his margins and those urban suburbs move even more democratic, I think that's going to make things even more competitive in North Carolina. Cassandra Brooks, a daycare center owner south of Raleigh, is part of that slippage. You voted for Donald Trump in 2016. I did. I voted for Donald Trump in 2016 because I felt like he was a business owner. Since COVID-19 hit in March, nearly 1.25 million have filed for unemployment in North Carolina and more than 150,000 residents have tested positive. I'm nervous about the economy. So many businesses are shutting down. Child care centers are shutting down left and right. I have friends who've never even reopened after this. Yay! Brooks daycare centers have struggled to stay open to look after the children of essential workers. Good job. We lost lots of income. We did lose some staff because they were afraid to work in these conditions. I was really expecting more. I was expecting for our administration to take uh, lead on this, telling everybody what to do, um, the best for health and safety for our children, for our, our teachers. If the economy improved in the next couple of months, and you heard some things from Donald Trump that sounded hopeful or, or on the job front or on helping people out on unemployment, and COVID's numbers started going down. Would you then consider voting for Donald Trump again? I would never vote for Donald T Trump again, ever in my life. If my life depended on it, I wouldn't. Ricky Hurtado is running for a state assembly seat and says that the pandemic is driving concerns in minority communities. The same inequalities that you see in our health care, our education and economic systems have also been reflected in who has been impacted by COVID-19. We've seen a disproportionate amount of black and Latino North Carolinians impacted by COVID-19. I do feel that this election is, is not just an economic imperative to get us back on track with the uh, impact of COVID-19, it is also a moral imperative to really begin a healing process for our nation, to really begin to bring our communities together. North of Raleigh is a man caught in between. Have you always voted Republican? I have, yep. And this year, undecided? Yep, right now I am, that's right. Ross Turnmeyer is the type of suburban voter Trump needs to keep and Biden needs to court. Last race. Working in um, residential Trump real estate, Turnmeyer and his family Trump have done well during a building boom um, in North Raleigh, but isn't sure he'll thing. support Trump uh, again. Some... I think a lot of people would look at you and go, how can you be undecided at this point? You've got Donald Trump who's been president for four years. Sure. You've got Joe Biden who's been around for a whole lot of time. <laughs> right. So what is it? You know, it it's, ends up being kind of policy versus person in my mind. I've always kind of really more aligned with the Republican Party in terms of their ideas about the platforms that they run the country from. 
Um, but then you look at President Trump, the way he kind of acts personally, he, he's very disparaging to people. Whereas when you look on the other side of the aisle, maybe I don't agree so much with a lot of policy or platforms, but at the former vice president, he certainly carries himself, I think, with a much higher level of polish and projects a sense of leadership that uh, you kind of expect from the role of president. We know we have to start talking Jonah about Jonah Kaplan, who covers Carolina politics for our affiliate in Raleigh, says Ross Turnmeyer embodies the challenge for both Trump and Biden in this battleground state. I think if you look at any swing state, they, again, <laughs> they're not the coasts, so they're not on the far right of the country, they're not on the far left of the country, they're in the middle. So that's not just a metaphor. People here are really in the middle, and they don't want to see any of the extremes creep into their politics. All making it a real tightrope for both sides. For ABC News Live, I'm Martha Raddatz in North Carolina. Our th thanks to Martha for taking that road trip for us. Turning now to the COVID-19 crisis and whether the administration is politicizing its response. The president promoting plasma therapy as a breakthrough after accusing the FDA of dragging its feet in approving potential treatments until after Election Day as part of a conspiracy to make him look bad. Our Steve Osinsami reports. A Florida judge tonight has sided with teachers who were ordered back to class by the governor and then sued. For now, in-person instruction is up to each school board. Today was the first day back for the teacher who took this striking photo of their classroom south of Jacksonville. Students sitting at these desks would not be required to wear masks. In Washington, the president has pushed the FDA, and now they're giving doctors the okay to use plasma therapy as emergency treatment for COVID-19. He's accused the agency of holding things up until after the election. This is a uh, powerful therapy. Less than a week ago, this same FDA was saying that this same therapy was promising but has not yet been shown to be safe and effective. What happened yesterday is that you saw the FDA being bullied by the, by the President of the United States. He's trying to now bully the FDA into approving a vaccine or vaccines before they've been adequately tested. Steve Osinsami joins us now. And Steve, over the weekend, we heard the president accuse the FDA of having members of the, quote, deep state working against his administration. Clearly, he'll be putting the pressure on them when it comes time to approve a vaccine. But what are some of the potential risks of prematurely releasing a vaccine? Well, you know, the, the, the biggest risks are safety concerns, safety concerns about, you know, whether the vaccine has been tested, whether it's even tested to be seen as effective. The FDA has now authorized emergency use of plasma therapies because of the president's pushing. But the FDA says tonight that they are making their decisions based on science and not politics. Lindsay. And, and Steve, there was that extremely discouraging headline today coming out of the University of Hong Kong reporting a case of reinfection. Uh, yes, that case involves a person who was sick with COVID-19 in Hong Kong, who recovered from the disease and then got sick again four and a half months later. It's got everyone talking about immunity, if immunity is real, and if so, how long does it last? But health authorities do underline that this is just one case. Lindsay. Right. Questions about those antibodies remain. Steve Osinsami, thanks so much for your reporting. And now to that one-two punch that has millions along the Gulf Coast on edge. Tropical Storm Marco is expected to make landfall with winds up to 50 miles per hour. But it's Laura right behind it. This was the scene of the destruction it left as it crossed the Dominican Republic. And this has so many more concerned. And now hurricane watches for that storm have been posted from Texas to Louisiana. Rob Marciano is in the storm zone and has the very latest. Tonight, mandatory evacuations along the Gulf Coast as families brace for the one-two punch of two tropical systems. In Grand Isle, Louisiana, residents racing to board up and get out. A wall of sandbags now in place to protect the island. And then there's this wall, new since Katrina, just east of New Orleans, designed to keep any Gulf surge out of the city. It is huge, 26 feet high and nearly two miles across. Oil and gas companies evacuating employees from offshore rigs and stopping production. The storm's hitting in the middle of a pandemic. There's still an awful lot of, of COVID out there. That should influence everything that you do. While Marco moves ashore, hurricane hunters are flying inside Laura. Now now near Cuba, targeting the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico, where it's likely to strengthen more. Laura bringing torrential rain and devastating flash flooding to the Dominican Republic and Haiti, the storm claiming at least 11 lives in the two countries. 
And in Puerto Rico, Laura knocking out power to more than 200,000 in the U.S. territory. Lots of people in the dark tonight. Rob Marciano joins us now. Rob, what's the latest track on these two systems? Well, we'll start with Marco. It's just now coming on shore here in Louisiana, so we have yet to feel the worst impacts of that. That will happen over the next few hours. East of here, you see it on the radar. That's where all the action is. Mississippi, Alabama, parts of the Florida Panhandle. There's tornado watches posted into southern Georgia until midnight tonight. This all rotates in overnight tonight. That heavy rain will come with it, but it should dissipate quickly tomorrow. And then all eyes are on the much larger storm, Laura, which is in the, along the south Cuban coastline. This will get into the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Mexico, very quiet wind there. It will become a hurricane tomorrow, potentially strengthening rapidly when we get to the day on Wednesday. And we're looking for fairly confident landfall somewhere between Galveston and, say, Lafayette, Louisiana, uh, Wednesday night to Thursday morning, and at least a Category 2 storm. So this is going to be much, much stronger than Marco was uh, that we're very confident on. And hurricane watches that are posted tonight just east of Galveston to, to Morgan City, some of that is going to be likely hurricane warnings by this time tomorrow. This could very well be a, a high impact event, Lindsay, potentially the, the worst we've seen yet this season. Yeah, people Lindsay. bracing and getting ready for the worst. Rob Marciano, thanks so much. And when we come back, the anger brewing tonight after the police involved shooting of a black father shot in the back while trying to get into his SUV. Three children in that back seat. What authorities are now saying? The postmaster general grilled today on Capitol Hill, calling some of the accusations against him outrageous, but continuing to refuse to bring back certain machines. And the recording of President Trump's sister blasting him made public by his niece. Welcome back. We turn now to Kenosha, Wisconsin, where protests have broken out after a black man was shot in the back by a white police officer as he was reaching into his car. Inside that car, his three young sons in the back seat. It was all caught on tape, and we do want to warn you that the video is disturbing. ABC's Alex Perez has the very latest on that city's state of emergency and what authorities are saying now. Tonight, this disturbing video throwing a city into turmoil. A black man walking away from police shot repeatedly while reaching into his car. Kenosha, Wisconsin police responding to a domestic incident at about 5 o'clock Sunday evening. The video starts with three officers following Jacob Blake, one of them with his gun drawn, grabbing Blake's shirt as he opens the car door and then opening fire, hitting him in the back. Blake's three sons in the car witnessing the shooting, his fiance there as well. We're just shooting them! with the kids in the back screaming. That don't make no sense that you treat somebody like that. Two of the officers are now on administrative leave pending an investigation. And let me be clear, this was not an accident. This wasn't bad police work. This felt like some sort of vendetta uh, being taken out on a member of our community. The incident immediately igniting anger and protests. Authorities firing tear gas at protesters. Dozens of cars set on fire, violence erupting. This officer knocked out after being hit with a brick. This didn't start with George Floyd, unfortunately. It's been around far longer than him. And if we don't do anything, this will continue as we saw yesterday. Tonight, the National Guard called in to support local law enforcement. For more now, let's bring in Alex Perez, who's in Kenosha on the ground, where authorities have called for a second night of curfews. What's happening at this moment, Alex? 
Yeah, Lindsay, authorities have called for that second night of curfew here. Overnight curfew, it begins at 8 o'clock tonight. And I want you to take a look behind me here. Much of the downtown Kenosha area, the small downtown here, it looks like this completely boarded up. This community preparing for possibly another night of more destructive protests. Lindsay? And Alex, do we have any update on Jacob Blake's condition? Yeah, Lindsay, we've actually heard from the governor here and from the attorney representing the family, Ben Crump. And at last word, they've told us that he remains hospitalized in serious but stable condition. Lindsay? All right, Alex Perez, thanks so much for your reporting. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime. Why California State Supreme Court decided to overturn the death sentence for convicted killer Scott Peterson. You may recall he was jailed for murdering his wife and their unborn son on Christmas Eve back in 2002. The wildfire emergency out west and the new threat of lightning making things all the more difficult. But up next, President Trump is behind in the polls right now. He says around this time in 2016 too, he was as well. We'll drill down on the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. News that the street outside the Staples Center in L.A. will be renamed Kobe Bryant Boulevard. Yesterday, the NBA legend would have turned 42. Let me speak, ancestors. now from the start of the Republican National Convention. We take a look by the numbers at the polls and how much can change in just a few months. Joe Biden now has a 73 in 100 chance of beating President Trump this November, according to current forecast by our partners at 538. 27 in 100, those are currently Trump's chances of winning at this moment. Pre-convention polling has Biden leading Trump by eight percentage points on average. That's the largest pre-convention lead of any presidential candidate since 1996, when President Bill Clinton held a 15-point advantage over Senator Bob Dole. And since 1968, no incumbent president has trailed as much as Trump heading into the first convention. But it is still early, and so much can change before November. The final vote typically differs by about five points from these pre-convention polling margins, according to 538. And sometimes we see dramatic comebacks, like in 1988, when Vice President George H.W. Bush trailed Governor Michael Dukakis by 17 points in July then went on to win the presidency just a few months later. Still lots to get to here on Prime. Our journey to one of the poorest and most diverse counties in North Carolina. Many in that community, members of the Lumbee tribe, often voted Democratic, but they broke for Trump in a big way. Will they do the same in 2020? One of the most influential figures in the Christian conservative movement mired in an alleged sex scandal, what Jerry Falwell Jr. claims his wife did and the accusations being leveled against him. Plus, the woman who was declared dead but found breathing in a funeral home hours later. But first, here's some of the trending stories on abcnews.com. Welcome to Disney Plus.
as Tropical Storm Marco weakens, so does the threat of storm surge along the Gulf Coast. It's a temporary relief for Louisiana. But officials say Tropical Storm Laura will gather hurricane strength, hitting the Gulf Shores with a wallop. Uh, and that is going to be a significant storm. The storm has already slammed the Caribbean in Haiti and the Dominican Republic, leaving at least eight people dead. Authorities telling residents it's safer to shelter at a friend's house instead of a large facility. Congregate shelters will remain a last resort uh, for anyone who, who needs to uh, evacuate. I did not direct the removal of blue collection boxes or the removal of mail processing equipment. On Capitol Hill, another day of grilling for Postmaster General Louis DeJoy. Withholding information from us, concealing documents, and downplaying the damage that you're causing. Democrat House Oversight and Reform Committee Chairwoman Carolyn Baloney alleging DeJoy is instituting a series of changes in order to aid President Trump's re-election chances. Democrats fabricated a baseless conspiracy theory. Republicans saying every postmaster general makes these kinds of operational changes. California keeps fighting a battle against wildfires that have burned nearly a million acres across the state you are now in a mandatory evacuation zone. and forced more than 100,000 people to flee their homes. The second and third largest fires in California history are burning around us at the moment. The fires killing a 70-year-old man. Firefighters are working around the clock, but resources are stretched thin, and new lightning storms are forecast to make the situation worse. Each and every county is now on high alert. Uh, due to the storm that's coming in, we have low personnel because they're all committed on other incidents. We, the jury, find the defendant, Scott Lee Peterson, guilty. Of the After nearly 15 years on death row, convicted killer Scott Peterson won't be put to death. A California appeals court overturned his death sentence, but the guilty verdict still stands. Peterson has been behind bars for murdering his wife Lacey and their unborn son on Christmas Eve in 2002. Their bodies dumped in the San Francisco Bay. California State Supreme Court found judicial error during sentencing. Prosecutors can refile, but California hasn't executed anyone since 2006. Talk about a mistake. A funeral home in Michigan discovered in the most shocking of ways a woman declared dead was actually alive. A funeral home in Southfield, Michigan was preparing the 20 year old for her final resting place when workers realized she was still breathing. This was a shock to them because she had been officially pronounced dead after firefighters responding to a 911 call found her unresponsive and not breathing. Well, that's what they thought. After the funeral workers realized the mistake, they called EMS again. She was taken to the hospital, and the woman is getting a second lease on life now. The case now under investigation to determine if first responders followed proper protocols. Welcome back. While the Trump family will likely paint this week's convention as a family affair, some extended members of the family are showing a split from the Trumps in the White House. In a series of conversations taped by the president's niece, Mary Trump, you hear the president's sister, retired federal judge Mary Ann Trump Barry, calling her brother a lying, cruel man with no principles. The White House forced to respond just as the GOP convention gets underway. Our chief national affairs correspondent, Tom Yamas, has the story. President Trump's sister, Mary Ann Trump Barry, blasting her brother in a batch of secret audio recordings obtained and verified by ABC News, first reported in the Washington Post. He has no principles. I'm none. None. You can't trust him. The retired federal judge labeling her brother cruel and phony. It's God and the lie. Oh my God, I'm talking too freely, but you know. It's a change of stories, a lack of preparation, the lying, the holy And taking on his administration's controversial policy to separate families at the border. But he's appealing to the base. What they're doing with the kids at the border, I guess he hasn't read my immigration opinions. Uh-huh. But, you know, well, one ear and out the other. That's what has he read. But, well, no, he doesn't read. Marianne also slamming her brother over his Twitter account. I said that to him about you know, six months ago. I said, get rid of Twitter. Stop this. He literally can't help himself. He can't. 
The leaked conversations between the president's sister and their niece, Mary Trump, were secretly recorded by Mary, who says she taped 15 hours of their face-to-face -face talks between 2018 and 2019 in order to protect herself from possible litigation over a family inheritance dispute. In her recently released book, Mary Trump calls the president, quote, the world's most dangerous man, and also alleges he cheated his way into UPenn's Warden Business School, which he regularly brags about attending. You do have one potentially explosive allegation in the book, at least one. Mm -hmm. um, and you write that uh, when the president was trying to transfer from Fordham to Penn, mm -hmm. he had someone else take his SATs? Yes. This was 1964. How do you know that? Um, I've been told this by people in my family. I am absolutely confident that it's true. In the audio recordings, Barry appears to support her niece's claim. Well, how did you know her? How did Donald know her? Through high school. I think in high school, but he always wired the tests. He was a great test taker. You know, you have people who do that. The White House has previously called the SAT allegation completely false. And President Trump releasing a statement about the audio leak saying every day it is something else. Who cares? This is politics as usual by, by uh, uh, a niece that uh, was written out of a will that would apparently uh, just has a, an ax to grind because she wants Joe Biden to be president. Our thanks to Tom for that. And as we covered, President Trump was in North Carolina today accepting his party's nomination for a second term. We heard from North Carolina voters earlier in the show, but we wanted to take a closer look in particular at a critical corner of this swing state in Robeson County. It's the poorest and most diverse county in North Carolina and home to the Lumbee tribe of Native Americans. For decades, they voted reliably for Democrats, but four years ago, they swung for Trump. Now they are gripped by the pandemic and a failing economy. So our Devin Dwyer went there to see where they stand now politically. Election season in Southeast North Carolina looking anything but normal. How bad is it? It's bad. It's really bad. The largest American Indian tribe east of the Mississippi with its growing political sway now consumed by the fight against COVID-19. Deaths are high as well. When we visited late last month, test kits purchased by the Lumbee were in short supply, along with financial aid from the federal government, which is contingent on federal recognition they don't have. And what people don't understand is that with federal recognition comes health care, comes free education, and those are the things that we are in need of right now. While the Lumbee have called this land home for centuries, the government has denied their claims of tribal identity and sovereignty, excluding them from legal status and federal benefits. Hey, uh well, Congress passed $8 billion for tribal COVID relief. The Lumbee did not get one cent. With help from global charities, the tribe is testing, feeding, and educating as many of its 55,000 members as it can. We have corn, tomatoes, handing out fresh produce, PPE, and teaching supplies. Nearly half of homes in the county don't have high speed internet. The Lumbee take pride in self-reliance, at once independent and patriotic. It says our country too, and we're going to defend it because it's our country, it's our land. Tribal Chairman Harvey Godwin says many are frustrated with the long-running battle with Washington. Do you feel like Donald Trump has delivered? We don't have federal recognition. And through this pandemic, uh, with the challenges that we're talking about, uh, as he delivered for America, I can only speak for uh, the Lumbee. But right now, we're struggling. The community is still recovering from Hurricane Matthew in 2016, when catastrophic flooding devastated families and breached a dam on the tribe's sacred lake. FEMA recently completed repairs to the dam, but tribal leaders are still negotiating the bill. We missed our powwows. All our powwows are held out here. These no prayers. Our elders come here and pray for this, the well-being of the people four mm -hmm. times a year. So it's, it's a sign uh, of hope that this yeah. is back. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Godwin credits the state's bipartisan congressional delegation with seeing the project through, a sign he says the Lumbee are emerging as a political force. Yeah.
Lumbee. After decades of voting reliably for Democrats, in 2016, the Lumbee broke big for Donald Trump. And last fall, in a special congressional election here, many backed the Republican candidate. This is about personalities. People are fed up. And they want a government that works. Joshua Malcolm is a former state election official and now chief justice of the tribal Supreme Court. Where people are moving now are more to unaffiliated. Some people call them unregistered. You can call them what you want to, but they're unaffiliated. And I think quite candidly, what that's all about is people are dissatisfied on both sides. The tribe's home in Robeson County is one of the most diverse rural counties in the country. Where minorities make up the majority. 42% identify as Native American. Registered Democrats outnumber Republicans by four to one, but those unaffiliated voters make up nearly a third. And now uh, we are a swing tribe too, which I think is good for all the Indian, Indian country for us to be this way. But to have influence, the Lumbee need to turn out. Few vote by mail, and by one estimate, just 20% of eligible Lumbee voters are registered. Donna Siemens is a nonpartisan voting rights advocate helping the Lumbee. The, the, on reservations, the way things work is word of mouth. If you want people to know stuff, you have to be on the ground to let people know things are happening. The pandemic promises to make that person-to-person -person work of getting Lumbee to the polls even harder. COVID is really muddying the waters, um, but we're resilient people. Lumbee recording artist Alexis Rayana Jones, a former contestant on American Idol, is among the tribe's young people working to boost voter registration. Being an indigenous person and living in the white man's world, it as indigenous people, it's hard to really get our story out there because people tend to forget who we are as a people um, and who we are as a race. Across the county at election headquarters, officials are scrambling too. And by the time the election rolls around, I'm sure we'll be busier than a one-legged man in a butt-kicking contest. Tina Bledsoe has been running elections in Robeson County for more than 25 years. Her team is still sourcing PPE for poll workers and new voting booths to help keep people more than six feet apart. How important is it ahead of November to get it right? It's crucial. As you know, we'll be in the spotlight. The Lumbee will be in the center of that spotlight, with their federal recognition still hanging in the balance. In a close presidential race in North Carolina, they could help decide whether the state goes red or blue. Tribal Councilman Jared Lowry says President Trump has a good shot. A lot of Lumbees gravitate towards somebody who he speaks a little different. He's not a politician. And you get the understanding that if he says something, he kind of he kind of means it, and it's very different. I cannot speak for all my Lumbee people, but um, to hear the things that this man has said um, and his viewpoints on indigenous people, um, on women, on the LGBTQIAP community, um, it's kind of hard to really um, agree with some of his views. The candidates that we have right now and the caliber of candidates that we have right now is just, it's frustrating to say the least. That frustration has political analysts watching the Lumbee as a wild card in November's election as tribal leaders tell their people that everything is on the line. How we're gonna go forward as a, as a people, how we're gonna go forward with, uh, with social injustice, with the pandemic, with health, uh, with the economy, re rebounding it with small business, everything Everything, everything has been affected by what we're going through now, and everything's on the line. For ABC News Live, I'm Devin Dwyer in Robeson County, North Carolina. Our thanks to Devin for that. And when we return, an in-depth look at the president's first term as he begins his pitch for a second. Stay with us.
nomination to lead their party if reelected in November. And that's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm about to switch sets and be joined by Tom Yamas in our powerhouse roundtable for night one of the Republican National Convention coverage. But before the president begins laying out his pitch to voters for another four years, Cecilia Vega gives us a look at his remarkable first term. He was the president few saw coming. Pundits. Donald Trump has shown himself to be a showman. I don't think he's a serious candidate. The poll this is really Clinton's race to lose. She leads in national polls. She leads in early voting. Even Donald Trump himself said he had doubts. So I sort of thought I lost, and I was okay with it. I wouldn't say great. In fact, I called my vice president and I said, it's not looking good, right, Mike? I said, not looking good. But he did win. His first 100 days in office just as unpredictable as his victory and filled with controversy. The new order suspends U.S. visas, including green cards, for citizens of seven predominantly Muslim countries, effective immediately. National Security Advisor Michael Flynn forced to resign. From the revolving door of departures, big names one after the next, to the steady stream of dizzying tweets, President Trump lashing out to his more than 85 million followers. Not to mention scenes like this, that now infamous moment in the wake of neo-Nazi protests in Charlottesville. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. But even in the chaos, These the administration the has seen legislative so success. Long, so it's always a lot of fun when you win. <laughs> The president fulfilling campaign promises, including criminal justice reform, pushing through a new tax plan, renegotiating NAFTA, and creating a Space Force, the first new branch of the military since the Air Force was added in 1947. But as for that promise to build a border wall that Mexico would pay for, so far, just four miles of a new wall have been built where no barrier stood before, and Mexico is not paying for it. Judge Gorsuch has outstanding legal skills, a brilliant mind. The Trump administration boasting about its sweeping changes to America's courts, more than 200 judges appointed, not to mention two Supreme Court justices, including Brett Kavanaugh, accused of sexual misconduct. His confirmation, a flashpoint for the Me Too movement. I am here today not because I want to be. I am terrified, but the details that about that night that bring me here today are the ones I will never forget. But I have never done this to her or to anyone. That's not who I am. It is not who I was. On the world stage among the administration's victories, the killing of ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and just recently a historic deal between the United Arab Emirates and Israel. But the president has also alienated many international allies in favor of his America First policy and that tough talk. We have a tremendous intellectual property theft situation going on. Economists say his Which trade war with China will cost the U.S. economy an estimated $316 billion by the end of this year. An airstrike on a top Iranian general this year brought the nation to the brink of an actual war. And it is a very, very busy Friday morning here at Good Morning America. And the, the U.S. and our allies on alert after that dramatic attack on Iran's top military commander. Yeah. Not to mention his dealings with dictators. The president first threatening North Korea's Kim Jong-un with fire and fury, only later to become the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in the hermit kingdom. The result? Experts say North Korea's nuclear arsenal is even larger today than it was before the two leaders met. But no country has created more controversy for President Trump than Russia. Even after the U.S. intelligence community concluded Russia did indeed try to tip the scale to help President Trump win in 2016, he sparked bipartisan outrage when he publicly bowed to Vladimir Putin when Putin denied Russian interference. Uh, I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this, I don't see any reason why it would be. A 17-month a 17 -month special counsel investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election and alleged ties between the Trump team and Russia confirmed Russia did indeed meddle in the election, but it did not establish conspiracy with the Trump campaign. I'm having a good day, too. It was called <laughs> No Collusion, No Obstruction. 
The president falsely claiming total exoneration, even though Robert Mueller's report specifically said the president was not exonerated, instead detailing multiple instances when the president may have obstructed justice. The trouble did not end there. Just a few months later, news of that now infamous phone call with the leader of Ukraine. Tonight, we now have the transcript of that call, and on it, President Trump says, I'd like you to do us a favor. He goes on to later bring up his political opponent, Joe Biden. President Trump accused of a quid pro quo, withholding military aid in exchange for an investigation into his political rival, Joe Biden. Ultimately, in just the third time in U.S. history, the House voting to impeach the president. The president leaves us no choice but to act. The Senate ultimately acquitting him, voting against removing the president from office, and the president was riding high. But this is what the end result is. But the next crisis was already taking hold, with the first confirmed cases of the coronavirus emerging. By the middle of March, all 50 states hit, forcing mandatory shutdowns. The president blaming China for failing to contain the initial outbreak, giving the virus that racist nickname. Your own aide, Secretary Azar, says he does not use this term. He says ethnicity does not cause the virus. Why do you keep using this? A lot it of comes say from it's China. racist. It's not racist at all, no, not at all. It comes from China. Now, COVID-19 has claimed more than 176,000 lives. The unemployment rate, historically high. It's going to disappear. One day, it's like a miracle. It will disappear. I said it's going away, and it is going away. Disappearing. It's going to disappear. And critics blaming President Trump for failing to take the pandemic seriously from the beginning. His already low approval ratings sinking. But through it all, the president's seemingly unshakable base has stuck with him. And now President Trump is counting on that base once again to propel him to a second term. Cecilia Vega, ABC News, New York. Let me speak, ancestors of the great warrior Mulan. ABC News special. Four more years, four more years. Republicans double down on President Trump, officially making him their nominee. With millions out of work, unrest in America, and a national health emergency, the president and his party begin to make their case for four more years. This is the most important election in the history of our country. Tonight, Nikki Haley, Senator Tim Scott, and 
and Donald Trump Jr. takes center stage. Live from New York City and across the country, here now, Lindsey Davis, Tom Yamas, and the ABC News powerhouse political team. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. And now it's the president's turn to make his pitch to voters to keep him in the White House. That's right, Lindsey. Just last week, the Democrats pulled off the first virtual convention. This week, the pressure and the spotlight on Republicans. Earlier in North Carolina, where the RNC planned to hold their convention before COVID, the president accepted his party's nomination for a second term. And tonight, we expect to see him again, along with his son, Don Jr., former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, and headlining the night South Carolina Senator Tim Scott. A lot of big speakers tonight, but of course, all of this taking place with the backdrop of the worst global health crisis in a century. Here in the U.S., more than 5 million Americans infected so far by COVID-19, more than 177,000 and counting, killed by the virus. The Republicans were reluctant to go virtual, briefly attempting to detour from North Carolina to Florida until cases spike there. Party leaders say this will feel more like a traditional convention. We're going to have to wait and see. The convention is also unfolding over continued racial unrest in our country, this time in Wisconsin, where police shot a black man multiple times, sparking protests there. We'll dig into that racial divide in America. And President Trump's claim that no president has done more to help black Americans in just a moment. But first, our powerhouse political team is here with us in New York, Washington, D.C., and across the country. But we want to begin with Mary Bruce at the Mellon Center in Washington, where those big speeches are set to take place later on this evening and Mary some big names uh, set to speak tonight but we've already seen the president during the roll call and we'll see him often throughout the convention which like so much in this presidency is rather different. Yeah, this convention is going to have a very different feel and a very different tone from what we saw last week with Democrats. Make no mistake, this is the Trump show. The reality television star is acutely aware of how everything plays on television, and that's going to affect everything that we see here. It's one of the reasons that we are standing here in front of the Mellon Auditorium. The president wants a more grand and regal feel to this, and for it to feel a little bit more like a, a traditional convention. He also was not a big fan of the Zoom-style virtual convention that he saw last week, which is why so many of the speakers are going to be live. So we will be hearing them tonight here inside what is a very uh, ornate regal space here in Washington. And then throughout the week, many of the speakers, uh, the president, of course, the first lady, will be speaking from the White House in an unprecedented move. The tone is also going to be very different. Uh, the, the White House and the president's team have been saying that they felt that the, the Democrats' convention was a little too downbeat, too downtrodden. They want this to be more optimistic, more hopeful in tone. That could be a challenge for the president, though, because based on his remarks, already kicking things off earlier today. He was back to sort of his usual litany of grievances. He has been painting a, a very apocalyptic picture of what will happen if Joe Biden is elected. The question here is whether uh, the president can stick a little bit more to the script as his party has outlined what tone we will hear tonight as Republicans try to reach beyond the Trump base uh, and appeal to a broader section of the electorate. And trying to make America great again, again. And Mary, today we saw 27 former Republican members of Congress abandoned their party and instead endorsed Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. This really highlights the divide in the GOP ranks between those who support the president and the never Trump faction. Absolutely. Those 27 Republicans led uh, by the most vocal among them, former Republican Senator Jeff Flake. He, of course, uh, is very familiar with criticizing the president. He, in fact, wrote a whole book after he left Congress, uh, taking aim at the president and his administration. But he was very blunt in saying that he feels that the president simply has abandoned conservative principles, making an appeal to conservative voters that if they hope to hold on to those principles, that Joe Biden is a better bet than Donald Trump. Uh, uh, it is a message that I think uh, is familiar to the Trump team. It is also uh, one that we have heard from Jeff Flake and many of these other Republicans t uh, over and over again. But it really does expose this stark divide and, and reminds you of where the Republican Party is today. Of course, four years ago at their convention, there was a lot uh, of still concern about whether the Republican Party would be able to come together behind President Trump. Now, four years later, make no mistake, the Republican Party is the party of Donald Trump. And those those who disagree with that are looking for a home. And those are the, the 27 Republicans that you heard uh, from today, Lindsay. And Mary, the president, of course, crisscross swing states to sway voters and steal headlines during the DNC last week. What does the Biden-Harris campaign have planned for this week? 
Well, so far it seems their plan is to lay low, and that is the tradition. The candidate who is not having the convention usually takes a step back and stays out of the spotlight. Of course, President Trump was quick to abandon that tradition last week. He was live tweeting throughout much of the Democratic convention. He was out uh, in, in several battleground states. A and so the question is, how exactly will Biden and Kamala Harris get their message out without any planned events right now? I suspect you will be seeing a lot uh, of statements and comments coming from their team. Joe Biden has been active on Twitter today, so we kind of have to see tonight how this plays out. But so far, no plans for the candidates, the nominees themselves, uh, to be out publicly this week. A critical week ahead. All right, Mary, thanks so much for that. Rachel Scott joins us now from Charlotte, North Carolina, where the president accepted his nomination for a second time earlier today. And Rachel, this really is a strange time for the president. If you looked at his body language today, he looked excited, he looked like he was happy, but his brother Robert just passed away, and then these audio re recordings surfaced, first reported in the Washington Post, also obtained by us here at ABC News, where he had his sister, a sister that he spoke about a lot on the campaign trail, and really throughout his career, how proud he was of her. She was calling him essentially a liar and a cheater. Yeah, Tom, the president has had to deal with a family tragedy and family drama all while preparing for the Republican National Convention. On Friday, the president held funeral services for his late brother, Robert, a man who he called his best friend at the White House. And then just 24 hours later, the secret recordings dropped, obtained by ABC News, as you mentioned, first reported by The Washington Post. His eldest sister, Marianne Trump Barry, saying that the president cannot be trusted, calling him a liar. Those are certainly words that the Trump campaign does not want to come to the minds of voters as the president makes his pitch to Americans this week at the Republican National Convention. The president, though, trying to brush this all aside, saying that every day is something else. Who cares? Tom? Yeah, and there was someone else in, in the president's life who is also leaving the White House, someone who is not related to him, who, but who has been a rock for so many years. Kellyanne Conway announcing uh, just yesterday, uh, overnight I should say, that she's going to leave the White House, leave her post to focus on her family. I think her words were uh, less drama, more mama, something, something to that effect. But she will still address the RNC today, this week? She will. She will stay in this post uh, until the end of the month. She still will address the Republican National Convention this week. But as you said, Tom, in her own words, less drama, more mama. She's stepping away from her role as a White House senior advisor to focus more on family. But she is one of the president's longest serving advisors, had been with him uh, since 2016. But her family has really been divided by politics as she has worked closely with the president. Uh, her own husband, George Conway, has worked to try and get the president defeated, co-founding uh, the Lincoln Project, who has been working to criticize the president in hopes of getting him out of the Oval Office in November, all while their family has fallen in the middle of this. Uh, one of their children, their daughter, is a very outspoken critic of the president at just 15 years old. Uh, both of them, Kellyanne Conway, George Conway, stepping out of their roles of politics for now to focus on family, Tom. But again, this comes just less than 100 days out from Election Day and, of course, on this critical, critical week for the president. Guys? It's such uh, an interesting family dynamic in the Conway household. I want to bring now Cecilia Vega. Cecilia, the president today, claimed a victory in getting swift approval for convalescent plasma donation treatment for COVID-19 patients, as many are actually concerned that he may be politicizing the vaccine approval process. Yeah, and, and he raised further eyebrows today, Lindsay, with a comment when he directly linked what the FDA did with this emergency into the authorization and said, we got the FDA to do it very quickly. So critics are certainly seeing this link between the politicization of the, the science that's happening at the FDA and, and what we're seeing today. So the president announced that there was what he called this major breakthrough. But I got to tell you, the reaction has been quite the opposite. Experts, uh, frankly, around the country who specialize in infectious diseases and the spread of them say this wasn't actually a major breakthrough at all. They call this an incremental step. And, and look, I'll tell you, I, I, I did speak with one of the nation's foremost experts today on infectious diseases, Dr. Ashish Shah uh, over at Harvard. And he said, uh, while this is incremental and he is very optimistic and very hopeful for the use of convalescent plasma to treat COVID patients, it's just so early. And he's not the only expert who's saying that, that, that there is hope that this will be a major step. But the real concern for many of these experts is that the president making an announcement along these lines, politicizing it the way that he has, could eventually uh, impede the actual studies that need to get done on the 
the use of convalescent plasma uh, and, and basically uh, stop it in its tracks from going forward. They say they need the science, not just a, po a political announcement like the one they saw at the White House yesterday. All right, Cecilia, thank you for that. COVID, the economy, so many issues affecting battleground states, just like they're affecting states all over the country right now. The president flipping six states four years ago that helped them deliver a victory, states like Wisconsin and even Michigan. And that state once again in play, but so are potentially red states like Georgia, maybe even Texas. Ultimately, most people believe the path to the White House will go through Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Arizona, and Florida. And joining us now is a senator from one of those states, Senator Rick Scott of Florida. Thanks so much for your time, Senator. It's great. It's great to be on tonight. It's good. This is going to be a fun week. We'll see, we'll see a big difference between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting week ahead. And your state, of course, was supposed to serve as the alternate host for the Republican convention before the spike in COVID cases over the summer ended those plans. As President Trump prepares to address Americans this week, how does he make the case that he's handling the response to the pandemic well and that voters should trust him with another four years? You know, I had hurricanes and I had a health care crisis while I was governor. And I never, you know, I, I always tried to say, what can I do better every day? I think one thing that uh, the big thing that the president did right is, you know, stop travel from China. Uh, I think Steve Hahn at the FDA has done a great job trying to increase the number of therapeutics, give doctors the ability to make decisions. I think everybody at every level of government could put out more information so people can make better decisions. Uh, I think people clearly could have worn masks earlier, social distance earlier, and if, the, if, we'd, if everybody had done that, uh, I think we hopefully would have seen uh, fewer people uh, get sick and hopefully fewer deaths. Senator, I want to turn now to mail-in voting. The president continues to criticize the idea of mail-in voting, although he has praised Florida's absentee ballot system, where he himself has mailed in his ballot. Is the president's rhetoric on this issue undermining confidence on Election Day? And could it actually hurt him in a battleground state like yours, where so many seniors and others really regularly vote by mail? Well, look, I, I hope it, I hope not because we have mail we have mail in ballots in Florida. It works. It's worked for we've been doing it for a long time. I've had three elections and we clearly focused on it. Uh, so I think we all want to make sure everybody that has a right to vote votes, but we don't want any fraud. Um, I'm glad the postmaster general has come out and said that he has plenty of resources, has plenty of money. He's going to do everything he can to make sure this election works right. I know our supervisor elections all across the country, Secretary of State, have to work with the post office to make sure these mail-in ballots get in on time. I think that's one of the issues that we got to make sure happens. Now, it appears that Congress is just nowhere on another round of economic stimulus for Americans still struggling with the fallout from the pandemic. You've made the case for a payroll tax cut and other tax cuts as the best way to stimulate the economy. But businesses have pretty widely rejected the idea of a payroll tax holiday because the bill would still be due later. So what will the president and Republicans be telling voters in terms of their plans to bring much needed economic relief? Well, we're having phone calls, we're having discussions every day about what we can do. I think the big issues that we're focused on is how do you help the people that have lost their jobs? How do you help our small businesses stay open or reopen? Uh, how do you make sure our schools get open safely? So we're working on all those, all those issues. And I'm optimistic uh, that we'll have a package uh, that we can get out there. Unfortunately, it's, it sure seems like uh, Pelosi and Schumer don't want to get something done. They look It looks to me like they think politically it's better for them if nothing gets done. But I think the American people deserve uh, to make sure we take care of the people that are hurting right now. On that point, Senator, you oppose continuing those expanded unemployment benefits at $600 a week like a lot of other Republicans. That's been a sticking point in the talk. So what do you say to Floridians who are out of work, though no, through no fault of their own, and who can't make ends meet, especially as we approach the end of this month? And, Senator, I know you were a businessman before you got into politics. Sure. You've got, we, first off, we've got to help the people that have, that have you know, lost their jobs, are struggling uh, to make ends meet. We've got to do that. What we can't do is put ourselves in a position that, that our businesses can't get reopened. So I'm glad the president uh, took use executive authority uh, to increase the uh, unemployment benefits at least uh, through the end of uh, September. I hope Congress will come back and do the right thing and help those people that have lost their jobs and still struggling to get back to work. And you've certainly had some tough words for your own states, Governor Ron DeSantis, including on not providing enough information to Florida residents as cases surged this summer. The situation has improved in recent weeks, but what went wrong in your state on the response and what needs to be done at this point to make sure there isn't yet another setback? 
I think all across the country, everybody that's elected has to be very vocal about what we all need to do to stay safe. We have to wear a mask. We have to social distance. I think we need to get more information out about where we're seeing the spread of coronavirus so people can make informed decisions. When I had hurricanes, I, took, I gave people the hard facts. Uh, when we had the uh, health care crisis, Zika, I gave people the hard facts. That's what we've got to do. And don't sugarcoat anything. Senator, so you're a Republican. Senator Marco Rubio, also a Republican. Governor Ron DeSantis, a Republican. The president needs to win Florida. I'm checking our, our partner's website here, 538, at some of the recent polling out of Florida. Biden plus six, Biden plus eight. A couple polls have him even. Biden plus four, plus seven. These are all recent polls. Do those numbers worry you at all? And, and what has the president asked of you personally when it comes to campaigning in Florida? Sure. Well, if the polls were right in 2016, we'd have President Hillary Clinton, and we didn't. The polls in my races always suggest, always said I would lose. The, what, what, why Trump's going to win in Florida is this. He cares about jobs. He cares about education. He cares about law enforcement. He's holding the Castro regime accountable. He's holding Maduro accountable. All these issues are important. He's supporting the military. All those issues are important to the voters of Florida. That's why I think he's going to have a big win in Florida. Senator Rick Scott, we thank you so much for your time. And when we come back, it's been a year where race in America has catapulted to the forefront of our national conversation. And President Trump hasn't always calmed the anger. More on that when we return. back everyone we're about to take a look at an image you'll likely remember take a look at this mark and patricia mccloskey is st louis couple who brandish weapons including an assault rifle outside their home as peaceful black lives matter protesters march nearby tonight they're speaking at the convention the couple initially said they were terrified by the black lives matter protesters matt gates a florida congressman who we'll also hear from tonight at the time tweeted an image of the couple adding this is all of us and lindsay the conversation on race will like Likely sound very different than what we heard the Democrats say last week. The deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and Rashard Brooks sent thousands into the streets. The Black Lives Matter movement expanding and leading the charge, while the debate over defunding the police also grew. And the president has called that group a symbol of hate, played into racial fears by warning suburban voters with veiled threats of an invasion, while also saying he's done more for black people than any other president in modern history. Our Steve Osinsami has more now on how voters see all of this. Racist, sexist, and I got Donald Trump. Go away. 
This is a president who is regularly described as racist by black and brown Americans. Every time you get on Twitter, every time you say anything, sir, you're saying it out of violence, out of hate. And we are tired of being hated. And in the streets, where the protests have helped reawaken many in this country to issues of racial injustice, they are not kind to President Trump. For many minorities who say they could never vote for the man, their grievances began on day one of his first campaign, just after he and his wife rode that escalator down into history. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. In one breath, he appears to defend neo-Nazis who fought with leftist groups in Virginia. They start, they start Mr. Excuse me, to protest. Excuse me, they didn't let themselves in. And you had some very bad people in that group. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. In another breath, he says he doesn't have a racist bone in his body. I am the least racist person there is anywhere in the world. In his opinion, he's done more to help black Americans in particular than any other president in modern history with opportunity zones for black businesses and an economy that for the most of his presidency was booming. Even some of his greatest black critics stood behind him when he signed into law criminal justice reforms. And again, nobody has done more right. the, for the, the, black to, Americans than I have. I understand. Paris Denard agrees and believes a growing number of black Americans are joining him. You see him often sitting in the background at the president's rallies. If this man was a racist, he's the worst racist I've ever seen, I've ever met, I've ever tried to get elected and reelected, because that's not what you do. Uh, you don't want to be seen, you don't want to invest, empower, uplift uh, black communities and brown communities and those that are forgotten men and women. You don't fight for them like he does. Even when you only got 8% of the vote, it doesn't make political sense to do what he does, but he's not doing it just for politics. He's doing it because it's the right thing to do. Denard once worked in George Bush's White House and says black voters need to pay a lot more attention to this comment from Joe Biden. If you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, and you ain't black. The black community is not a monolith. And we are fair, open-minded, and independent thinkers in this 2020 election. It's got to be difficult to be a uh, black Trump supporter in today's environment among black Americans. No, it, it's not. I, I, I would say that for me, it's not. Because I remember something that my granny and my papa taught me years ago. They said, know who you are and whose you are. And if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And so for me, I proudly walk around with my MAGA hat. I proudly tell people that I'm a Trump supporter. I proudly go on shows like this to, to show people that it's okay. He says that efforts by people on the left to defund police forces in this country are a winning issue for the president because even in communities of color, families want the police to help keep them safe. What has Trump done for black Americans? Well, aside from the bill he recently signed for HBCUs, there really isn't much else. What has Donald Trump done for black people? Are you serious? Donald Trump has done nothing for black people, let me be clear. The government he represents condones the killing of black people across the country. In my opinion, the one positive thing Donald Trump has done for black people is to expose to the nation what many of us already knew, and that's that racial injustices and inequalities are still very much alive and well. To many minorities in this country, the president is riding a new wave of fear among white Americans that took off with the election of this nation's first black president. He has promised to make America great again. And many voters of color are asking, great again for whom? For this couple in St. Louis, who stood outside their home and pointed their guns at black protesters, they will be appearing at the president's convention this week. Or for these people. Trump's deporting your illegal cousins today. All across America. Please leave my vehicle. Is that because I'm white? No, sir. You're not white. You're a Oh, man. Whose racism is so fueled by their ideas of this president that they even say his name as they're recorded in public telling other Americans that the president is going to send them somewhere else. Asian piece of So when President Trump says he's going to keep criminals from invading the suburbs. I'm the only thing standing between the American dream and total anarchy madness and chaos. Many Americans hear a racist dog whistle that's quiet but quite effective.
And this is a tried and true tactic in American politics, appealing to white resentment, white racial anxiety, uh, and white prejudice. It's something that has been done with great success by conservative political candidates going back many, many years. But in this case, the fear of losing ground to black and brown people seems to be a strong motivator in this election. If I've had 100% or 90% of the good stuff, and now you're telling me I got to make do with maybe just 70 or maybe 62%, which is the percentage of the country that's white, like saying that I only get my share, that I don't also get your share, right, feels like oppression. The more we move toward equality, those who have had privilege and advantage often don't have the coping skills to deal with equity. It is absolutely 100% certain that racial fear will be at the polls this November, and as the president likes to say, on both sides. For ABC News Live, I'm Steve Osinsami in Atlanta. And we thank Steve for that comprehensive report right there. Let's bring in our powerhouse roundtable, Matt Dowd. I'll start with you. Joe Biden said he entered this race because of how the president handled Charlottesville. Movements need to have a moment, and that tells the story of why Biden decided to get into this race. We've seen the protests, the massive crowds. Do you think that energy translates into votes for Joe Biden and against Donald Trump? Well, I think we have one test point on it, which was the 2018 midterms, which the Democrats won overwhelmingly, part of which was part of this discussion, but not near as much as it's been this summer. I think this is going to be a con huge, continued part of the political equation in this. And if you take a look at the polls, Tom, the, uh, Joe Biden leads Donald Trump on who can best deal with ra race relations by more than 20 points. And so if this is a conversation that continues, which I think it will continue, it's on a very disadvantaged disadvantageous ground for Donald Trump in this. And so, yes, I think this is going to be part of it. It keeps happening, as the story earlier in the show showed, said in Wisconsin. This is going to be front and center until we get to Election Day. Let's bring in Republican strategist Sarah Fagan. After Mitt Romney lost his bid for the White House, it was said that the Republicans needed to widen the tent, bring more people into the tent. Would you say that President Trump's words and actions have been able to do that? And doesn't even matter if he's able to get enough of the white vote. Well, I think it does matter. It certainly matters for the party long term. And I don't think Republicans have done as good a job as we've needed to on these issues. Um, but I think in many ways, when you think about Trump, you know, his words oftentimes are very different than his actions. He misses opportunities to heal. And I think that that is one of the reasons, as Matt pointed out, that he is at a deficit to Joe Biden on these issues. It's because of his words or, or sometimes his lack of words. But his actions have a different story. Um, black unemployment under this president pre-COVID was the lowest it had ever been in recorded history. It's a fact. He's done a good job on the economy and that benefited all Americans, including black Americans. He passed and signed and pushed criminal justice reform. And Alice, um, Alice Johnson is going to speak later in this convention, a woman whose life was dramatically impacted because of an action Donald Trump took. Uh, and then, of course, Tim Scott, who's going to headline this evening, um, pushed police reform. Uh, Republicans got behind a bill. It uh, banned chokeholds, it put money in for funding for police reform, and many would argue that Democrats blocked that bill. One, it didn't take, didn't go as far as the Democrats wanted to go, but they blocked it in part because they liked the political issue. That could be law today, that could have been signed by president. Republicans were unified around improvement, and Democrats blocked it. But there's a political calculation when it comes to the president and all of this. I want to bring in Alex Castellanos, a Republican consultant. Alex, you know, the president has hammered Joe Biden, falsely accusing Joe Biden of wanting to defund the police. We heard it right there in the Robin Roberts and David Muir interview. Joe Biden does not want to do that. But there are people on the far left that do want to defund the police. And the president is now using that to his advantage. In 2016, it was, you know, law and order. And now it's this idea of defunding the police that the president is capitalizing on. Well, I'm not so sure that Joe Biden's being uh, square with us on this. I, I would make the point that if Donald Trump said, no, no, I'm not defunding the police, I'm only diverting some funds to other programs, I don't think he'd get the same slack Joe Biden is getting on this. And look, a lot of the, Joe Biden's not going to govern by himself if elected president. As you pointed out, a lot of people around him uh, are a little farther to the left than Joe has historically 
really been. So on this issue, I think the president uh, has got something he should press here this week. Tara Setmeyer joins us now. She is part of the Lincoln Project, a group of Republican political activists and strategists who are actively campaigning against the president. The Never Trump movement was knocked out in 2016. Not only did he become president, he took over the Republican Party. How do you convince Republicans who have stuck with Trump this long to finally switch to Biden? Well, I don't know that it's trying to convince people who are still with the president at this point. I mean, if you are still supporting the president um, after so many failures, after all of the things that he's done with COVID-19, with his cozying up to uh, our enemies and dictators, to the mess that, that the economy is now because of his lack of leadership with COVID, um, him playing footsie with white nationalists. I mean, the list is very long of, of grievances and of, of things that Donald Trump has done that are not Republican by any means. So um, those aren't the people we're trying to reach. We're trying to reach the people who held their nose and voted for Donald Trump because they couldn't stand Hillary Clinton and they thought that perhaps he would grow into the job. There are a lot of those people who are in suburban neighborhoods, in suburban districts across, across this country who did not vote for Republicans in 2018. If you see the landslide in so many Republican, what were once Republican districts, that now are Democratic districts, it shows you that there are Republicans who are uncomfortable with this, and there are plenty of independents who are also uncomfortable with what Donald Trump has done and the lack of leadership. So what we've done at the Lincoln Project and what we're focusing in on is letting people know that it's okay if you are uncomfortable with what, Don what Donald Trump is doing because he poses an existential threat to our constitutional republic. And the couple of Republican uh, policies that he may have supported or passed are not worth the chaos and the division that he has caused in this country and that we can't take another four years of it. Yvette Simpson, CEO for Democracy for America, progressive Democrat, want to bring you into this. Only 8% of black uh, people voted for President Trump four years ago. Only 3% of African Americans think that President Trump has actually done a good job at reducing discrimination against black people in the criminal justice system. It seems like it should be a slam dunk for Joe Biden, and yet maybe it's not. You know, I think when you put those statistics out there, I think it is. I mean, black folks are, are have been with um, the D Democratic Party for a very, very long time. This president has moved, I think, more black people to Joe Biden than anybody could, and here's why. Because the, the difference is stark. Donald Trump could care less about black people. He's made that very, very clear. I want to talk about the tokenization of black people in his campaign, the fact that he seems to use black people uh, as, as pawns. We can think back to the State of the Union, which was really stark. He honored a Tuskegee Airman and then gave the Medal of Honor to Rush Limbaugh in the same breath. You hear him talking about Charlottesville, good people on both sides. And I think black people have awoken to that. No, we don't think Joe Biden is perfect. And yes, we're going to continue to push him to be better. But the alternative is stark. And what we know is that under a Joe Biden presidency, we're at least not going to have someone that's stoking the fire of racism, who is using African-Americans and actually not delivering for us, and, and, and creating the type of unrest uh, that we're seeing in places like what we're seeing in Wisconsin today. Let's bring in Terry Moran. He joins us now. Terry, back in 2016, Trump's base was motivated by his message. This convention, the Republicans don't particularly have a party platform. There's no build the wall theme this time. Uh, Tonight, Senator Tim Scott will headline tonight's convention. Herschel Walker uh, will speak on his behalf, um, the famed NFL uh, running back who was quoted in an article back in 1985 saying that Donald Trump would make a great U.S. president, and he tonight apparently is going to try to make the case that Donald Trump is not racist. Diversity is going to be on full display, but as you saw in Steve O's piece, many are not buying it. That's right, Lindsay. You know, th that is a great point. In 2016, in 2016, if you had asked Americans a week out of the election, what does Donald Trump stand for, whether they supported him or didn't support him, 95% of them could have said at least one thing, build a wall, ban Muslims, bring back jobs, go after China. They were all cut, drain the swamp in Washington. That's a platform. Uh, you might not think it's that sophisticated, but those are ideas, those are practical ideas that people responded to. What does Donald Trump stand for this time? And it has astonished me that it me that. seems again and again he wants to push all of his chips into the middle of the table and play the race card. You know, what is he talking about, really, when he's talking about saving the suburbs from uh, a Department of Housing and Urban Development run by Cory Booker? 
which is one of the sneering con uh, comments that he made on Twitter. Uh, what is he talking about when he, when he catastrophizes Black Lives Matter and calls it essentially an anti-American movement? He wants people to respond along the lines of race. All right, our Terry Moran, who we were just listening to right there, we're going to dip into the RNC coverage of the first night of their convention right now. Uh, Timothy Dolan, Reverend Timothy Dolan, is wrapping up the prayer in front of the Statue of Liberty right now. And I see him right there, Lady Liberty, on full screen, as we head to the Mellon Auditorium of Washington, D.C., a World War II veteran the and the Pledge of Allegiance. Of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. It is an honor to be with you tonight. My name is Charlie Kirk. I run the largest pro-American student organization in the country, Turning Point USA, fighting for the future of our republic. Speaking to you in my personal capacity tonight as a 26-year-old, I see the angst of young people as well as the challenges facing new parents. I am here tonight to tell you to warn you. Okay, we were just listening to Charlie Kirk there, the founder of Turning Points USA, a conservative organization that, that looks out for quote-unquote liberal versus conservative uh, teachers on college campuses. Yvette, I wanted to go back to you and talk to you about something because there's 10 weeks left in this campaign. We, we saw a little bit of the problems Joe Biden has had there with, with black voters, and you were talking about this. With him not being able to campaign, to go out there to meet with voters, is 10 weeks enough time to maybe fix any of those problems he may have, because he needs as many votes as he can get come November. 10 weeks is not a lot of time, and I think that's why you're going to see a lot of surrogates, you're going to see a lot of people, activists, organizers already out there talking to other black voters, really making the case for the stark difference between the two candidates, not really trying to push Joe Biden as this person who's going to be, you know, the, the savior of black people. We certainly don't need that. Um, but I think certainly helping people understand how important this election is. I think the real challenge is engaging voters who did not vote in 16, I keep saying it over and over again, but who voted in 08 and 12. And the hope is that Kamala Harris, the excitement around her, the, the black women who are going to mobilize around her are going to be enough. I would say to Joe Biden, and this is something that I've said before, the less he says when it comes to race, I think sometimes the better, because he does sometimes stumble. And I think that's because he's got a comfort level that doesn't always translate very well because he's kind of an older, uh, older guy. And so I would say stay away from those conversations. Let surrogates have those conversations. Certainly allow Kamala Harris to organize the way that only she can. And I think we we will get there. But right. yeah, 10 weeks is not a lot of time. Okay, and the clock is ticking. As we look back at, at what's happening right now at the Republican National Convention, Charlie Kirk there, uh, the founder of Turning Points USA, essentially the new face of the Young Republican Party. And Sarah, my question to you, what, what is the status of, of young Republicans nowadays? We, we think back to the 80s and Michael P. Keaton and, and, yeah. and guys in, in blazers with ties, and yet the young conservatives that, that Charlie represents um, are much different. They're much more aggressive. They're out on campus. They... they, they if we can say want to get in people's faces to say that they're much more active on both social media and getting out there, but the kind of conservatives that Donald Trump likes. Well, look, I think, you know, certainly Trump's stamp on the party has, has had an impact on young people as well. Um, it's, it's had an impact in the sense, too, that, you know, fewer young people are supporting this president than some previous Republican president, so he has work to do with that demographic group. But I think what's happening on college campuses is, is partially Trump. It's also, also partially, when you think about just the lack of diverse opinion, education, intellect, opinion, and, you know, speakers getting canceled on campus, uh, any Republicans. You know, we've seen examples of professors who say, you know, if you have a pro-life view, you're not allowed to speak. I mean, this happens in college campuses. And so I think that also is contributing to sometimes when you see these young people who are who are very articulate and passionate about these issues, it's because of what's happening all around them. The politicization, uh, politicalization of everything in society, including on their campus. We're going to bring in Alex in just a minute, but I just wanted to stay with that notion of Charlie Kirk. We're, gonna, we're obviously hearing from him tonight. I'm also going to hear from Donald Trump Jr. Both of them were briefly suspended from Twitter when they tweeted out messages about hydroxychloroquine being 100% effective right. cures 
for coronavirus. Are you concerned at all about the Republican message when it comes to facts and people kind of feeling like that there's this loosey-goosey, we can say anything whether it's true or not? I think that's a problem across politics, to be totally fair. I mean, people get on Twitter and they just repeat whatever their you know, whatever they've seen recently. And the president's gotten in trouble by retweeting other people's tweets. Um, so, you know, uh, Charlie Kirk's a bright young man. He's got a bright future. Um, you know, a lot of conservatives, though, do feel like they get targeted on these platforms. And, you know, he shouldn't say that a, a drug, when he's not a medical professional, he shouldn't espouse the value of a drug he doesn't know to be 100% effective. But I would question, does that happen as much on the left? Because I'm not certain it does. And you'll see the Trump campaign and the RNC talk about the cancel culture this week a lot. And increasingly, conservatives do feel like on these social media platforms, there's a different standard for them. And for what they're, when they're just retweeting something, there's a different standard than if somebody on the left is just, re, just retweeting something. Alex, let's bring you back in here. How do you think that Republicans should try and appeal to those few undecided voters that may still remain out there? Well, I think uh, the two great motivators in politics are hope and fear. And uh, they, they always seem to work, and because it is an important choice. And I think this week it's important for the Republicans to say, look, this is not about who is the worst or best person. This is about who is best or worst for the country. And here's the two different directions we're going to go in that these Democratic candidates, uh, you know, show them on that debate stage where they all raised their hands and said they were going to decriminalize coming to this country illegally and give everyone who did free health care that you, the taxpayer, would pay for. I think you, you have to force the choice this week. Imagine 2021 if Joe Biden's there. Uh, Black Lives Matter is going to have a great influence. And yes, we all want racial justice, and we've seen some horrible things. But guess what? We've also seen that movement turn into something violent and 88 nights of riots in, in Portland. And we've seen it say it wants to destroy capitalism. And that's going too far. So I think this is the week. If you want to appeal to those swing voters in the suburbs, don't focus on who the two guys are because it's not about the candidates. Explain that it's about you and your future. And you've got two very different futures ahead of you. Matt Dowd, I want to bring you in now. Uh, what's your take on the Obama voters that swung towards Trump? In the autopsy of the 2016 election, a lot of those voters said they believed Trump would keep or grow their jobs. The economy was moving until the pandemic. So do you think what, what happens with those swing voters? Do they say, listen, the pandemic wasn't the president's fault. Maybe he could have done a better job. Let's give him another four years. Or do you think they're done with him and they swing back to Democrats? Well, again, just as I said previously, we have one data point, and a whole bunch of those voters that were Obama Trump voters voted for the Democrats overwhelmingly in the 2018 midterm elections. I'll also say this is not a 2016 election. 2016 election was an open seat in, in for the presidency. This is a referendum on Donald Trump, and I think the Republicans and Donald Trump make a huge mistake by not focusing more positively on himself and staying away from the negative on Joe Biden. Keep in mind one data point. In 2016, uh, a number of people had unfavorable opinions of both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Donald Trump won those people by 16 points, the people that didn't like either candidate. Today, the people that don't like either candidate are voting for Joe Biden by 17 points. And so I think the strategy for Donald Trump at this convention, he somehow has to raise his job approval number. It's at 41 percent. No president has ever won re-election under 49 percent job approval. When I worked for George W. Bush, the main thing we focused on was George W. Bush's job approval number, because we knew we had to get it to 50 or 51 if we wanted to win the election. So if they spend this entire week, four days, attacking the Democrats and talking about how bad things are in America because of the Democrats, which is a right direction, wrong track question, which goes to the detriment of the Republican, of the incumbent candidate, they're going to be losing this campaign. Donald Trump's key strategic imperative is to somehow raise his approval rating at this week and before he gets to Election Day. 
But Sarah, you know, a lot of the programming over this week will be about those forgotten Americans. And I think those forgotten Americans were those yeah. Obama voters that, that swung to, to President Trump. They wanted to give him a chance. Do you think those voters, and it's the same question I asked Matt, do yeah. you think those voters will stick with Trump or will they want to forget Trump? Well, I think it depends on how the next 10 weeks unfold, to be totally honest. I mean, look, COVID has had a dramatic impact. Right now, this is the COVID election, and that's not great terrain for any incumbent because it hasn't, it, it, we haven't seen a great outcome. Things are improving, and if things continue to improve and the economy continues to improve, he has a leg to stand on with those voters. Um, I don't think the electorate is blaming Donald Trump because of uh, COVID-19. They do want to know how they're going to get their job back. And Donald Trump still wins on the economy. Matt Dowd is right. Trump needs to focus on how he's going to improve things and how he's going to make people's lives better. He did that well in 2016. He needs to do that in the next, over the next four evenings. Yvette, we're going to see a lot of Donald Trump over the next four nights. Is that going to help or hurt Democrats? Uh, I think it's going to help us a lot. Donald Trump is his worst enemy, and he can't help himself. I mean, he, he projects, he deflects lots of misinformation. I'm going to be counting the number of dog whistles I hear over the course of the next four days and tracking that. A lot of hyperbole, a lot of false information. And so I think the more that he does that, he appears less stable. We know that it's about Donald Trump. People right Right now want it to be about them. And so I think the more he talks, the better the Democrats will do. Terry, uh, I want to bring in Terry Moran again one, once more before we go down to the convention. Uh, I was going to say convention hall. Actually, just, just the convention. There's no convention hall. We see a president who's on the move, Terry, who's working to win. We see a challenger who just told ABC News he won't be on the move. He wants to be responsible and that people are hearing his message through the Internet. Is that a gamble? You know, we'll find out because it is novel territory for all of us. We've not had a presidential election like this. Look, back in the 19th century, presidents used to stay in their homes. Abraham Lincoln never left Springfield. That was considered the proper way of doing things. But really, for a long, long time, presidents have gone out on the hustings. That connection, politics is about connecting. Can you connect in a Zoom conference? I, I, I'm, I'm challenged in my own life. And Donald Trump, the one thing he loves is stand in front of a crowd and connect. All right, Terry Moran with a very honest assessment of his uh, Zoom capabilities. All right, Terry, thank you. We want to go down to the convention now. Uh, Representative Matt Gates from Florida. Emptier than Joe Biden's daily schedule. But we are a nation of full hearts and clear minds. We see the choice clearly. Strength or weakness, energy or confusion, success or failure. President Trump is the first president since Reagan not to start a new war. Biden has foolishly cheerled decades of war without winning, without end. President Trump knows we are strongest when we fight hardest, not in distant deserts, but for our fellow Americans. We must fight to save America now, or we may lose her forever. Joe Biden might not even notice. Settle for Biden. That's the hashtag promoted by AOC and the socialists. The Woketopians will settle for Biden because they will make him an extra in a movie written, produced, and directed by others. It's a horror film, really. They'll disarm you, empty the prisons, lock you in your home, and invite MS-13 to live next door. And the police aren't coming when you call. In Democrat-run cities, they're already being defunded, disbanded. Blaming our best and allowing society's worst? That's the story they write in Hollywood. That's if the lights even stay on in California anymore. A state that cannot keep power running for its own people should not send its junior senator to be vice president. They used to write only in fiction, but nightmares are becoming real. Cops killed, children shot. At the Democrat convention, they say, if you vote against Trump, it will all stop. Appeasement is never a winning strategy. No, we won't settle for violence in our neighborhoods or at our border. We won't settle for decades of bad decisions by basement-dwelling Joe Biden. We settle a continent. We know that the frontier, the horizon, even the stars belong to us. Donald Trump, like all builders, is a visionary. That which is built in the mind is even more powerful than the brick and mortar that holds it together. First comes the mind, then the making. First comes the vision than the work. Washington, Lincoln, and Jefferson are immortal precisely because of the pull they have on our imagination. You cannot cancel a culture that loves its heroes. 
The dangerous left need America to be weaker to accomplish their goal of replacing her. We know that to make America great again, we must first make something of ourselves. That is the meaning of true strength. My great-grandfather was a railroad man. As a Florida man, I watch our rockets routinely send the brightest beyond the heavens with our flag and our hope. America is the greatest country that has ever existed. Don't let any celebrity, athlete, or politician tell you otherwise. President Trump sometimes raises his voice and a ruckus. He knows that's what it takes to raise an army of patriots who love America and will protect her. We must win this election if we cherish our country as much as we should, for there is no place to run, no refuge for freedom should we fail. America is not just an idea or a constitution, it is our home. We must protect our home with unbreakable made in America strength, strength I see every day in President Donald Trump. Thank you. President Trump spoke about a positive convention, and we just heard from one of his biggest supporters there, Representative Matt Gates, who had a smile on his face, Matt Dowd, but painted a very dark picture if Democrats win. What was your take on that message? I think it's bad. I mean, but bluntly, it's bad message. I think if they continue like that throughout this convention, um, it's not good for Donald Trump. As I said earlier, they have to figure out a way to raise Donald Trump's approval rating among the American public, ba basically talking all the, about the darkness in America and, and this ex extravagantly drawn mythic thing that they think um, is, is on the verge of, which is all negative and dark, doesn't help them. An incumbent has to figure out how to make Americans feel better about where they stand today, not feel worse. So I think check mark number one, they're off on a bad strategy. All right, our thanks to you, Matt. Still to come tonight, Donald Trump, Junior Senator Tim Scott, and former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley. Stay with us. With so much.
Welcome back, everybody. Republican Chair Rona McDaniel now addressing her party. Let's listen in. Good evening. I'm Rana McDaniel, Chairwoman of the Republican National Committee. And on behalf of everyone in our party and President Trump, thank you for tuning in as we kick off this historic convention. As we speak to you tonight, we send our thoughts and prayers to those facing terrible fires in California, recovering from storms in Iowa, and preparing for hurricanes in Louisiana and the Gulf Coast. Democrats started their convention last week with Eva Longoria, a famous Hollywood actress who played a housewife on TV. Well, I'm actually a real housewife and a mom from Michigan with two wonderful kids in public school who happens to be the only, only the second woman in 164 years to run the Republican Party. And unlike Joe Biden, President Trump didn't choose me because I'm a woman. He chose me because I was the best person for the job. Four years ago, President Trump started a movement unlike any other. And over the next four days, we will hear from a few of the millions of hardworking, everyday Americans who have benefited from his leadership. If you watched the DNC last week, you probably noticed that Democrats spent a lot of time talking about how much they despise our president. But we heard very little about their actual policies. Policies that would have been unthinkable a decade ago. Policies like banning fossil fuels, eliminating private health insurance, taxpayer-funded health care for people who come here illegally, and defunding the police. Their argument for Joe Biden boiled down to the fact that they think he's a nice guy. Well, let me tell you, raising taxes on 82% of Americans is not nice. Eliminating 10 million good-paying oil and gas jobs is not nice. Policies that force jobs to flee our country or allow abortion up until the point of birth are not nice. The truth is, there's only one person who has empathized with everyday Americans and actually been fighting for them over the past four years, and that is President Donald Trump. In the nearly four years I've worked on behalf of President Trump, I've seen up close a man who has a deep love for family, a man who has reverence for the office of the presidency, a man with an incredible respect for law enforcement and our military. I've seen private moments where he comforts Americans in times of pain and sadness. Now everyone knows he can be tough. He's tough when he takes on China, tough when he works to fix our unfair trade deals, tough when he fights to secure our borders. President Trump is always going to be tough when he is fighting for the American people because nice guys like Joe cared more about countries like China and Iran than the United States of America. Tonight begins a new chapter in the great American story a story that has inspired the world for generations. And when we reelect President Trump this November, the best is yet to come. This election is the most important in our lifetime. Your vote counts more than ever. If you want to check your voting status, secure your ballot, or register to vote, text VOTE to 88022. Earlier today, President Trump and Vice President Pence came to North Carolina to thank our delegates for unanimously renominating them to a second term. Our official roll call and the business of our Republican convention was conducted today in Charlotte. We have created a short video to symbolize the excitement for President Trump across all 50 states and territories. Thank you for watching. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. The great state of Alabama. Alaska. American side boy. Arizona. Arkansas. California. Colorado. Connecticut. Delaware. District of Columbia. Florida. Georgia. Guam. Hawaii. Hawaii. Idaho. Illinois. Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, 
Minnesota, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, the North Carolina, North Dakota, the Northern Mariana Islands, Ohio, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Puerto Rico, Rhode Island, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee. This is an ABC News special. Carolina, then Jacksonville, Florida. Now it's something of a split. The proceedings already underway in Charlotte and Washington, D.C. We're going to hear from President Trump tonight at least twice. Also, his son, Don Jr., his son's girlfriend, campaign finance chair Kimberly Guilfoyle, the president's first ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, a former governor of South Carolina, and that state's junior senator, Tim Scott, the only black Republican in the Senate. And after the Democrats devoted so much time last week to ravaging President Trump's handling of the pandemic, the GOP will fight back tonight, defending Trump, attacking Joe Biden, and shining a light on frontline workers like Amy Ford. She's a West Virginia nurse who volunteered in New York this spring. She's about to speak right now. Let's go down to the virtual floor. Our laws and our Constitution. By supporting law enforcement, it's so important for keeping America great. As long as I'm president, I will never that I promise you. It's time to deliver a victory for the American people. We are going to start winning again. It's called Promises Made, Promises Made. Ford. I've been a registered nurse for 17 years. I'm from the small town of Williamson, West Virginia, where I've lived my entire life, the daughter of a nurse and a coal miner. Even though I was the youngest of four children, I was always somewhat of a caretaker. It came natural for me. So it felt right to follow in my mother's footsteps and become a nurse. And this March, when COVID-19 sent our country into crisis, I knew I had to help any way that I could. I deployed to New York in April and then to San Antonio, Texas, working as a COVID relief nurse in both states. As I contended with the challenges of treating our patients who had their worlds turned upside down, I noticed a positive change in our healthcare system. President Trump recognized the threat this virus presented for all Americans early on and made rapid policy changes. And as a result, telehealth services are now accessible to more than 71 million Americans, including 35 million children. Prior to COVID, telehealth was not covered or reimbursed under Medicare, Medicaid, or CHIP. This left our most vulnerable populations with no other choice but to have an in-person office visit with their physicians, increasing their risk of exposure to COVID-19 exponentially. The expansion of telehealth services has also resulted in the integration of video visits between patients and their families, allowing loved ones to have contact and visualization as well as a better understanding of care. Telehealth has been essential during this pandemic. I don't want the media taking my personal story and twisting it, so let me be clear. As a healthcare professional, I can tell you without hesitation, Donald Trump's quick action and leadership saved thousands of lives during COVID-19. And the benefits of that response extend far beyond coronavirus. Telehealth will continue to aid many that are just unable to find transportation or a way to the doctor for regular checkups. This is especially true in rural America. I live in a town of about 2,000 people. 
We do not have buses, trains, trolleys, or Ubers available to us. In addition, the unavailability of services can also hinder treatment for many. So increased access to telehealth for millions of Americans has truly been life-saving, and we have President Trump to thank. Testimony to President Trump and telehealth from Amy Ford, a nurse from West Virginia. I want to go to Mary Bruce, who's outside the Mellon Hall, where we just saw Amy Ford speaking. Republicans pretty determined during this convention had this mix of speakers both live in that hall, even though it's pretty empty, and on tape. They want this to have a very different feel from what we saw last week at the Democratic convention. The Trump team, the White House say this will feel more regal, more like a traditional convention. It's part of the reason that we are here at the Mellon Auditorium. As you can see, it is quite a grand space, and they are trying to have more live speakers throughout. Look, the president is acutely aware and interested in how things play on TV. He wants a show. In fact, he is bringing in uh, producers from his former show, The Apprentice, to help him run this. And we are, of course, going to be hearing much more from the candidates himself, the president making an appearance every night. So will members of his family. And they want a different tone here as well, George. We have heard Democrat, or we've heard the Trump team say that they feel that the Democratic convention was too downtrodden, that it was too dark. They say that this will be much more hopeful and optimistic. The big question is whether the president himself can stick to that script. Given what we heard from him earlier today as he kicked things off, it was a speech full with a litany of grievances. And he has been painting quite an apocalyptic picture of what what he says will happen to this country if he is not reelected. Mary Bruce, thanks very much. We're here with World News and Anchor David Muir as well. This is Donald Trump's show. This really is his show, and he faces an extraordinary challenge, George, because he knows the reality in this country. We now have more than 175,000 American lives lost in this pandemic, and I think it's very interesting that symbolically to kick off this convention coverage that they would have Amy Ford, this nurse practitioner, the, the daughter of a nurse and of coal miner, talking about um, telehealth and, and some of the ways that she she believes that President Trump has helped uh, in the handling of this pandemic. The president knows he doesn't want this to be a referendum on the handling of the pandemic, but he knows that's the reality that he faces. And I think it'll be uh, fascinating for us to see over the course of the next four days how often they dip back into the story of the pandemic, the reality of what this country is facing, uh, defend uh, the president and in many cases his family members defending their father, uh, because we know this will be a family affair as well, uh, and how often he tries to remind Americans about what many of them thought was a very good economy before this and what he believes will happen once we get through the pandemic. It was clear, uh, Lindsey Davis, that the Democrats all week long last week believed this is the issue he must be judged on. Right, and there you have it, front and center, the frontline worker. And I think that the coronavirus narrative is one that a lot of people are going to be paying attention to. If you look at that, more than 175,000 figure of people who have died, Americans who have died, half of them people of color. Uh, when you compare us to other countries, ours is not a success story. 58% of Americans disapprove of the Trump administration's handling of the coronavirus. And yet, uh, during the roll call today, we had President Trump touting uh, the response of his administration as a success. I think that we're going to hear several more Amy Ford-like stories of everyday Americans who say that this uh, administration has not only uh, saved their lives, but also their livelihoods. Lindsey Davis, thanks. Chris Christie, how much offense, how much defense on COVID for the president? Oh, I think you'll see... 80% offense, 20% defense, if that. And the 20% defense will probably come from other speakers, not directly from the president or his family. I think with most of that, they'll be on offense. Um, that's just who he is, and that's what he's going to be. And he's not going to come out there and um, make excuses or, or anything close to apologies for anything that people think may have been done wrong. He's going to emphasize the things he believes he did right, and he's going to be on offense saying, you know, it's getting better and better, and by the time we get to November, it's going to be even better than it is now, and next year is going to be even greater unless you make a mistake and vote for the other guy. I think that's what you're going to be hearing from him all week and, and, and probably from the vice president as well. Rahm Emanuel, all last week the president was out during the Democrats' convention. So far today, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris pretty quiet. Is that the right strategy? Well, they're quiet, but they are not quiet. There's an attack ad up in North Carolina about Goodyear. And because the president of the United States is trying to boycott Goodyear, they have a big operation, big factory. So I think you'll see some attack ads up there. You'll see some other type of stuff coming from surrogates directly that interrupt and make different messages. I do want to say that I think on this issue, historically, the economy is the number one issue that defines whether people reelect or don't reelect somebody. 
I do believe, given the magnitude and the scope of everybody's life being unchanged because of COVID, that if you look at the data today and all the polling, how you feel about the COVID and how you feel the government handles, specifically the president, is a bigger determiner than what you think about the economy and how you're going to vote. But Sarah Fagan, the president, still does have an advantage on the economy. He still has an advantage on the economy. When, when voters are asked, who do you trust more, they trust uh, Donald Trump over Joe Biden. And this is something he's going to have to exploit throughout this week. Uh, the reality is, pre-COVID, this was the strongest economy, certainly in modern history. Uh, record unemployment for minorities, uh, um, increased wages for the first time in over a decade. So he has a good story to tell on this. Okay, Sarah Fagan, that's for, thanks very much. We're about to hear from the president for the first time tonight, honoring frontline workers. Let's tune back into the virtual floor. When the China virus invaded our country, we launched the greatest mobilization of American society since World War II. Patriots of every race, color, and creed rallied together to defeat the invisible enemy and save the lives of their fellow citizens. Today, our hearts overflow with appreciation for the incredible frontline workers who risk their own health and safety to keep America strong and safe. When crisis came, millions of everyday Americans rose to the challenge. In their actions, we see true greatness of the American character. We always find a way to victory. History will remember and celebrate the heroes of 2020 for as long as our great American flag waves over the land that we love. To every frontline worker, I offer the salute of a nation that is forever in your debt. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America. These are my friends. These are the incredible workers that helped us so much with the COVID. Uh, we can call it many different things, from China virus. I don't want to go through all the names, because some people may get insulted, but that's the way it is. These are great, great people, doctors, nurses, uh, firemen, uh, policemen. We want to thank you all. You have been incredible, and we want to thank you, and all of the millions of people that you represent. Thank you all very much. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. So tell me a little about your stories. How about we'll start with you? I'm a postal worker. Delivered to the senior community during COVID-19. Good. And we're taking good care of our postal workers. Absolutely. That I can tell you. <laughs> Believe me, we're not getting rid of our postal workers, you know? They'd like to sort of put that out there. If anyone does, it's the Democrats, not the Republicans. I want to thank you very much and thank everybody in that whole beautiful post office system. We appreciate it. How about you? I'm a trucker. Good. Yep. I own a small business in Ohio. Great. Uh, Hull and steel mostly. Um, you know, some of our customers actually made hospital beds with uh, some oh, wow. material. That's fantastic. Well, congratulations. I love the truckers. You know, they're on my side. Thank you. Mr. I think all of them, frankly. I think pretty much all of them. How about you? I'm a custodian at the post Good. office as well. What do you do exactly? clean up everybody's you know, mess and everybody's germs and all that. Can I tell you, that, that world, that profession will never be out of business. You yeah, know that, right? Sure. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. For Thank you. Me. And how about you? Um, I'm a registered nurse, President Good. Trump. I uh, work at a New Jersey hospital. It's called Virtual Willingboro Hospital. Right. Um, I also represent an organization of professional nurses. It's called the National Association of Catholic Nurses. Very good. But I want to tell you, sir, as a nursing supervisor, I am so in awe of your leadership. Honestly, uh, I know many people have said often interesting things, but it takes a true leader to be able to ignore all that stuff and do what is right and not be offended by all the words being said. Yeah. And you really do show that positive spirit to us. And as nurses, I appreciate that. But just as an individual, I'm grateful for that. Well, I'm for the nurses. I'm for the doctors. I'm for everybody. We just have to make this China virus go away, and it's happening. Please, go ahead. Uh, I'm also a nurse. I represent Genesis Healthcare, which is a skilled nursing facility Good, sure. company. Um, I want to thank you and your administration for all the supplies and support and right. funding that you've given the skilled nursing units. Um, without that, we couldn't do as well as we have done. Um, I spent some time in New Jersey. I live in West Virginia. Went to New Jersey and, and did some work there. And we finally started to see things change and turn around. I appreciate what you said because we have delivered billions of dollars of equipment that governors were supposed to give and in many cases they didn't get. 
So the federal government had to help them, and all of the people that did this incredible work, they never got credit for it. But you understand where it came from. Thank you very much. Thank you both. It's really nice. Please, go ahead. I'm a police officer in Inglewood, Colorado, and I contracted COVID in late March and recovered. That means we don't have to be afraid of you at all. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Good to Once go. you're recovered, you know, we have the whole thing with plasma happening. Mm -hmm. That means your blood is very valuable. You know that, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. Great. Please. I'm a detention deputy at the Kern County Sheriff's Department out in California. Great. And uh, I also contracted COVID um, into March and recovered from that also. How long was your problem? Um, I was sick about 10 days, really bad. I got everything besides a cough, um, but recovered. I was off work for a month and a half and I work in our local county jails. Did they do anything specifically to help you recover? They gave me Z-Packs, medication, cough syrup. Okay, and I won't even ask you about the hydroxychloroquine because <laughs> it's, uh, it's a shame what they've done to that one, but, but I took it. I took the Z-Pack also and zinc. I want to thank you all very much. It's an honor to have you in the White House. You're fantastic people, and the people you represent, you represent an incredible group of people, and uh, we love you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you so much. it. Good evening. I'm Congressman Jim Jordan, representing the 4th District of Ohio. The Republican Party is the pro-America party. President Trump is the pro-America candidate. This election is about who can preserve the values, principles, and institutions that make America great. Don't believe me? Look at what's happening in American cities. Cities all run by Democrats. Crime, violence, and mob rule. Democrats refuse to denounce the mob, and their response to the chaos? Defund the police, defund Border Patrol, and defund our military. And while they're doing all this, they're also trying to take away your guns. Look at the positions they've taken in the past few months. Democrats won't let you go to church, but they'll let you protest. Democrats won't let you go to work, but they'll let you riot. And Democrats won't let you go to school, but they'll let you go loot. President Trump has fought against each of their crazy ideas. He's taken on the swamp all of the swamp, the Democrats, the press, and the never Trumpers. And when you take on the swamp, the swamp fights back. They tried the Russia hoax, the Mueller investigation, and the fake impeachment. But in spite of this unbelievable opposition, this president has done what he said he would do. Taxes cut, regulations reduced, economy growing, lowest unemployment in 50 years, out of the Iran deal, embassy in Jerusalem, hostages home from North Korea, a new U.S. MCA agreement, and of course he's building the wall and rebuilding our economy as we speak. I love the president's intensity and his willingness to fight every day in Washington for our families. But what I also appreciate about the president is something most Americans never get to see, how much he truly cares about people. Our family has seen it two years ago. Our nephew Eli was killed in a car accident. He lived a mile up the road from us, grew up wrestling and training with our boys, was a high school state champion, varsity athlete for the University of Wisconsin. It was a Saturday morning, three days after the accident. I walked to the car to head up to Eli's parents' home when the president called. We talked about a few issues, and then he asked how the family was doing. I said, they're doing okay, Mr. President, but it's tough. The president said, yeah, losing a loved one is always difficult. And it's really tough when they're so young. I then said, Mr. President, I'm actually walking into their house right now. Obviously, they don't know that I'm talking to you. But if you'd be willing to say hello to Eli's dad, you'd make a terrible day a little less terrible. What's his name, the president asked. I walked through the door and said, Todd, the president wants to talk to you. For the next five minutes, family and friends sat in complete silence as the president of the United States took time to talk to a dad who was hurting. That's the president I've gotten to know the last four years. The president who shared private moments like this with soldiers, victims of violent crime, and people who've had businesses destroyed by the mob. That's the individual who's made America great again and who knows America's best days are still in front of us. And that's why I'm busting my tail to help him get reelected. I'm asking you to do the same. Thank you and God bless our country. Seeing a different side of Jim Jordan, they're hearing a different side of the president from Jim Jordan, who was, of course, one of the president's most stalwart defenders in the House during the impeachment proceedings. I want to bring in Yvette Simpson for more on this as well. I want to go back to what the president was saying uh, about COVID, a couple of things there. He called it the China virus. Uh, 
also talked about how governors, he said, uh, were not doing the job of getting the equipment to their states. The federal government had to step in. A lot of governors have a different view. Right. I mean, there's a lot you can do when truth isn't a requirement. I mean, there was a lot there that just did not feel right. And, and I think the interesting thing just about that exchange, George, was you've got these people. He tried to mimic the thing that, that Biden did with the people. You know, he clearly does not have that comfort level to be talking to people who either battled the virus or confronted they the virus. They seem pretty happy. And I don't know. Well, he said China virus. And I like I like feel like there was a tense moment in the room when, when, when you say things like that or when you, um, you're supposed to be talking to people about their experiences and you're shifting to a very political point that could be divisive. And so it's clear for me in this first like couple minutes about what this is about, that he's really talking to a small group of people who already believe his message, who are getting smaller and smaller, who aren't, um, you know, he's not talking about the way it's impacting people, but just politics. And I think that's a bad move. Oh. It's really, really bad. I want to bring in John Carl for more on this. And, and John, that is one of the questions for the president in this convention. It, will he be able to reach out beyond his base, not just energize his base? Well, uh, he's done precious little of that over the past three and a half years. But if you look at the, uh, the, the agenda here for the convention, I mean, this is going to feature the big windup, the last three big speeches. Uh, one of them is Don, Donald Trump Jr., but we're also going to hear uh, from Nikki Haley, of course, the former governor of, of South Carolina, and also from Tim Scott, the, uh, the current governor of, of uh, South Carolina, I mean, the current senator uh, from uh, South Carolina, somebody who is uh, the, uh, the only African American who has served in both the House and the Senate. And both of them um, uh, offer uh, messages which, uh, which I think frequently try to appeal uh, beyond the, the, the base. Both of them uh, were very instrumental in removing the Confederate flag uh, from, the, uh, from, the, from the State House in South Carolina. So at least in, in what they're putting forth tonight on night one of the, of the convention, it does seem like there is uh, an effort to try to get somewhat beyond uh, the base that the, that the president talks to so frequently. And building on that, that, we're about to hear from Vernon Jones. He's a Georgia state legislator, Democrat, who's endorsed Donald Trump. We'll hear from him on the other side of the break. We'll be right back. The Republican National Convention, here again, George Stephanopoulos. Back now with our continuing coverage, night one of the Republican National Convention. Of course, this was all supposed to be taking place in Charlotte, North Carolina. A bit of that did happen today. The president was in North Carolina for the official roll call. Rachel Scott is there. Rachel. 
Hey, George. Yes, but this is definitely a different convention than the Republicans had planned. And today kicked off with a little bit of a sense of disappointment, although there was excitement. Uh, the GOP chair, Ronna McDaniel, even admitted today that she wishes that they could have had this convention as they had planned. Uh, there were about 300 delegates inside today. The president, of course, crashing his own party, surprising those delegates. And even one trying to amp up the crowd just about an hour before he touched down, uh, saying that they needed to play larger than life here, that they needed to amp up the energy inside of the room. But, you know, I have talked to campaign sources. They have promised that this week is going to be a week of optimism. The president himself says that he wants this to be an upbeat week, but the message that he delivered today uh, here in Charlotte was anything but that, uh, talking about this dark picture under a Biden administration, pushing these unfounded claims about mail-in voting, and even saying that if he loses this election, it is because it is stolen from him and because it is rigged. George. Rachel Scott, thanks very much. I want to bring in Matthew Dowd, our, our political analyst. And Matt, you helped craft conventions for George W. Bush, Republican conventions for him. Let's talk more about this effort by the president to reach out beyond the base during this convention. Well, I, I think he has to because all he has right now, and you can see it reflected in every single poll number, is about 40 or 41 percent of the country. You can't win an election. You can't win the Electoral College that way, and you can't win the popular vote that way. I think the president, I watched that video that he featured before he spoke. That's, the, to me, the strategy they have to play more of every night and not go into this negative, dark situation. The president cannot win re-election unless he moves his job approval numbers into a positive territory. He has to move his job approval numbers in positive territory. The problem for the president is, on an th issue like COVID-19, is a vast majority of, of the country thinks he's mishandled it and disapproves of him on the job. So every time he talks about it, they're reminded of the negative job he's done on the situation. But I think the speakers tonight, the ones we hear from tonight, they have to paint a positive picture of the of the president and paint a vision of what the president's going to do in the next four years. Every time they go to dark side, it hurts the incumbent running for re-election. The next one is Vernon Jones, Georgia State Legislator, a Democrat who's endorsed Donald Trump. Let's listen. Hello, America. My name is Vernon Jones, and I'm a state representative from the great state of Georgia. As you can see, I'm a man of color, and I'm a lifelong Democrat, too. You may be wondering, why is a lifelong Democrat speaking at the Republican National Convention? And that's a fair question. And here's your answer. The Democratic Party does not want black people to leave their mental plantation. We've been forced to be there for decades and generations. But I have news for Joe Biden. We are free. We are free people with free minds. And I'm part of a large and growing segment of the black community who are independent thinkers, and we believe that Donald Trump is the president that America needs to lead us forward. This is no time for sleeping in the basement. Joe Biden has had 47 years to produce results. But he's been all talk and no action, just like so many of the Democrats who've been making promises to the black voters for decades. We've been their captive audience. When President Trump sought to earn the black vote, the Democratic Party leaders went crazy. Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer literally started wearing kente cloths around the, the, the U.S. Capitol, as if pandering were enough to keep us satisfied. Let me tell you why I'm supporting our president. I grew up in the South, in Laurel Hill, North Carolina, Scotland County, the Green Pond community to be exact. My parents, Robin and Rufa Jones, built with their own hands a four-room cinder block home with no indoor plumbing. They had very limited education, but they instilled in us a strong work ethic that drove me from those tobacco fields of North Carolina to those hallowed halls of the Georgia General Assembly. My parents taught me if I believed in God, worked hard, and treated every person fairly, there was no limit to what we could achieve. I attended North Carolina Central University, an historical black college. 
For generations, HBCUs have been the incubators that develop black scholars in math and science and religion, engineering and politics. They have been important springboards for the black success. But Democrats haven't treated them that way. When President Trump took office, he changed everything. He delivered historic funding to HBCUs, and he guaranteed it for 10 years, something that has never happened in the history of this country. That gave our HBCUs stability, the chance to grow, and produce the next generation of black leaders. That's right, Donald Trump did that. He's also supported school choice to ensure that no child, no matter their race or zip code, is left behind. Every child should have access to a quality education. But education is just the beginning. The president also built the most inclusive economy ever with record low unemployment for African Americans and record high participation in the workforce. He put opportunity zones in the Trump tax bill that would drive investment into our communities for decades to come. He put the interests of American workers, and especially black workers, first. That's right, Donald Trump did that. He delivered historic criminal justice reform. He ended once and for all the policy of inc incarceration of black people which has decimated our communities, caused by no other than Joe Biden. Democrats wouldn't do it, Obama didn't want to do it, and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris definitely wouldn't do it. But Donald Trump did it. He's also working every day to make our communities safer. As a former executive of DeKalb County, Georgia, I directed one of the largest public safety departments in the Southeast. I've seen tragic shootings on both sides, officers killing citizens and citizens killing officers in the line of duty. Police officers are our fellow citizens. They live in our country. They have families, too. They live in our communities. Unfortunately, Democrats have turned their backs on our brave police officers. They call it defunding. And it's a danger to our cities, our neighborhoods, and our children. Isn't it ironic that Democrat politicians have personal security to protect them? So why don't they forego their security and replace them with social workers, especially since that's what they want for you and me? Our police need more funding, not less. For frequent psychological examinations, for non-lethal remote restraint technology, and for more de-escalation and use of force training. These are the common sense solutions that President Trump supports. True, sincere police reform. That's right, Donald Trump did that too. Education, jobs, safety, security, on issue after issue, and in just a single term, he destroyed these negative forces that have victimized the black community for decades. He gave us the opportunity to rise. Now, you know, when I made the public announcement of my support for President Trump, all hell broke loose. I was threatened, called an embarrassment, and asked to resign by my own party. Unfortunately, that's consistent with the Democratic Party and how they view independent thinking black men and women. But I'm here to tell you that black voices are becoming more woke and louder than ever. The Democratic Party has become infected with a pandemic of intolerance bigotry, socialism, anti-law enforcement bias, and a dangerous tolerance for people who attack others, destroy their property, and terrorize our own communities. That's what this election is all about. And that's why right now, more than ever, more than ever before, America needs Donald Trump in the Oval Office for another four years.
God bless you and vote Donald J. Trump. Thank you. In 2018, a gunman walked into Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, and changed my life forever. My name is Andrew Pollock. His name isn't worth saying. One of the seniors walking in the hallways that day was my beautiful daughter, Meadow. She was just months away from graduating and beginning a new life. We were so proud of the woman she had become. But in the hallway on that third floor, the gunman saw Meadow and shot her down the hallway, hitting her four times. After she was shot and on the floor, she crawled over to another student, a freshman girl, to protect her. She draped her body over her, and then the scumbag gunman shot my daughter at point-blank range five more times, killing Meadow and the girl she was shielding. She had a whole life ahead of her. And in that life, she could have done anything and been anything. So many moments that I waited so long for were taken from me. I didn't get to drop her off at college. I didn't get to walk her down the aisle. But every moment was taken from her, and for what? I never wanted this to become a political spectacle, but it did. I never wanted to meet the president like this, but I did. I was invited to the White House. The truth is, I had just buried my daughter that week. I really wasn't interested in public events like a tour or a photo op. I was interested in answers and solutions. So if the president wanted to meet me personally, I said I'd go. They said, of course, that was his plan. At the White House, my family and I sat with the president in the Oval Office and told him about Meadow. I told him what we knew. I told him that his administration needed to take a closer look at what went wrong and why. And I got to see who President Trump really is. He's a good man and a great listener, and he cuts through the BS. Then the president did what he said he would do. He took action. He formed a school safety commission that issued dozens of recommendations to make schools safer. But I'll bet you never heard about that. Instead, the media turned my daughter's murder into a coordinated attack on President Trump, Republicans, and our Second Amendment. In fact, when President Trump asked me and other parents of children that were murdered in school shootings to join him as he announced the commission's findings, the media's first question wasn't about protecting kids. Shockingly, they asked about the government shutdown. President Trump turned to me appalled and said, Andy, can you believe these people? We're trying to talk about school safety, and this is what they do. But I could believe it. After my daughter's murder, the media didn't seem interested in the facts. So I found them myself. I learned that gun control laws didn't fail my daughter. People did. The gunman had threatened to kill his classmates before. He had threatened to rape them. He had threatened to shoot up the school. Every red flag you could imagine. But the school didn't just miss these red flags. They knowingly ignored them. Far-left Democrats in our school district made this shooting possible because they implemented something they called restorative justice. This policy, which really just blames teachers for students' failures, puts kids and teachers at risk and makes shootings more likely but it was billed as a pioneering approach to discipline and safety. I was just fine with the old approach to discipline and safety. It was called discipline and safety. But the Obama-Biden administration took Parkland's bad policies and forced them into schools across America. When President Trump rescinded Obama's guidance on restorative justice policies, he put an end to that. And that meant the world to me. It's hard to tell how much Mr. Biden understands about what happened at Parkland. Mr. Biden has campaigned on bringing back restorative justice as part of, as part of his unity platform with Bernie Sanders and has pledged to implement in school districts across America. But he doesn't even seem to know when the shooting happened. He said that he was vice president when it happened, but he wasn't. 
Mr. Biden may not know when my daughter was murdered, but I do. February 14, 2018. Mr. Biden may not know that these policies make shootings more likely, but I do. Mr. Biden may not know who was vice president that day, but I do. It wasn't Joe Biden. It was Mike Pence. Thank God. And I know who the president was, too. It wasn't Barack Obama. It was President Donald J. Trump, and he took action. I truly believe the safety of our kids depends on whether this man is reelected. I hope you'll join me in helping to make that happen. Mr. President, myself and millions of Americans appreciate you and love you. God bless America and God bless our president, Donald J. Trump. Thank you. Harsh attack there on former Vice President Biden from Andrew Pollack. His daughter, Meadow, was killed in the Parkland shootings in January 2018. So that is a theme that has been started by the Trump campaign, questioning the mental faculties of former Vice President Biden, also themes of violence and law and order. And now we're about to hear from Mark and Patricia McCluskey, who actually face felony charges for waving firearms in a threatening manner at demonstrators in St. Louis back on June 28th. Let's listen in at the home of Mark and Patricia McCluskey. The husband and wife attorneys charged with pointing guns at protesters. They were simply trying to protect their home. Good evening, America. We are Mark and Patty McCluskey. We're speaking to you tonight from St. Louis, Missouri, where just weeks ago you may have seen us defending our home as a mob of protesters descended on our neighborhood. America is such a great country that not only do you have the right to own a gun and use it to defend yourself, but thousands of Americans will offer you free advice on how to use it. At least that's what we experienced. What you saw happen to us could just as easily happen to any of you who are watching from quiet neighborhoods around our country. And that's what we want to speak to you about tonight. That's exactly right. Whether it's the defunding of police, ending cash bail so criminals can be released back out on the streets the same day to riot again, or encouraging anarchy and chaos on our streets. It seems as if the Democrats no longer view the government's job as protecting honest citizens from criminals, but rather protecting criminals from honest citizens. Not a single person in the out-of-control mob you saw at our house was charged with a crime. But you know who was? We were. They've actually charged us with felonies for daring to defend our home. On top of that, consider this. The Marxist liberal activist leading the mob to our neighborhood stood outside our home with a bullhorn screaming, you can't stop the revolution. Just weeks later, that same Marxist activist won the Democrat nomination to hold a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives. In the city of St. Louis, that's the same as winning the general election. That Marxist revolutionary is now going to be the congresswoman from the 1st District of Missouri. These radicals are not content with marching in the streets. They want to walk the halls of Congress. They want to take over. They want power. This is Joe Biden's party. These are the people who will be in charge of your future and the future of your children. They're not satisfied with spreading the chaos and violence into our communities. They want to abolish the suburbs altogether by ending single family home zoning. This forced rezoning would bring crime, lawlessness, and low quality apartments into now thriving suburban neighborhoods. President Trump smartly ended this government overreach, but Joe Biden wants to bring it back. These are the policies that are coming to a neighborhood near you. So make no mistake, no matter where you live, your family will not be safe in the radical Democrats' America. At this moment in history, if you stand up for yourself and for the values our country was founded on, the mob, spurred on by their allies in the media, will try to destroy you. You've seen us on your TV screens and Twitter feeds. You know that we're not the kind of people who back down. Thankfully, neither is Donald Trump. President Trump will defend the God-given right of every American to protect their homes 
and their families. But more than that, Trump's vision for America is a country where you have an opportunity to work hard and build the life you dream of with a job you love, with your children being educated in great schools, in a community where your family can play in the backyard without fear, worship in a church without shame, and express your beliefs without retribution. Trump brought us the greatest economy our country had ever seen. The Democrats have brought us nothing but destruction. When we don't have basic safety and security in our communities, we'll never be free to build a brighter future for ourselves, for our children, or for our country. That's what's at stake in this election, and that's why we must re-elect Donald Trump. God bless you, God bless the president, and, and God, God bless, bless these United, United States. States. America. I'm Kimberly Guilfoyle. I speak to you tonight as a mother, a former prosecutor, a Latina, and a proud American. And yes, a proud supporter of President Donald J. Trump. Why? Because he is the president who delivers for America. He built the greatest economy the world has ever known for the strivers, the working class and middle class. As commander in chief, he always puts America first. President Trump is the law and order president. Now presidential leadership is not guaranteed. It is a choice. Biden, Harris, and the rest of the socialists will fundamentally change this nation. They want open borders, closed schools, dangerous amnesty, and will selfishly send your jobs back to China while they get rich. They will defund, dismantle, and destroy America's law enforcement. When you are in trouble and need police, don't count on the Democrats. As a first-generation American, I know how dangerous their socialist agenda is. My mother, Mercedes, was a special education teacher from Aguadilla, Puerto Rico. My father, also an immigrant, came to this nation in pursuit of the American dream. Now I consider it my duty to fight to protect that dream. Rioters must not be allowed to destroy our cities. Human sex drug traffickers should not be allowed to cross our border. The same socialist policies which destroyed places like Cuba and Venezuela must not take root in our cities and our schools. If you want to see the socialist Biden-Harris future for our country, just take a look at California. It is a place of immense wealth immeasurable innovation, an immaculate environment. And the Democrats turned it into a land of discarded heroin needles in parks, riots in streets, and blackouts in homes. In President Trump's America, we light things up. We don't dim them down. We build things up. We don't burn them down. We kneel in prayer, and we stand for our flag. This election is a battle for the soul of America. Your choice is clear. Do you support the cancel culture, the cosmopolitan elites of Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and Joe Biden, who blame America first? Do you think America is to blame? Or do you believe in American greatness, believe in yourself, in President Trump, in individual and personal responsibility? They want to destroy this country and everything that we have fought for and hold dear. They want to steal your liberty, your freedom. They want to control what you see and think and believe so that they can control how you live. They want to enslave you to the weak, dependent, liberal, victim ideology to the point that you will not recognize this country or yourself. From the beginning, when President Trump spoke about making America great again, he was speaking about that shining city on a hill and restoring the beacon of light that once shined so bright. 
His promise was to put America first, and he has. When President Trump cut middle-class taxes, putting tens of thousands of dollars back in the pockets of working-class Americans, that beacon began to flicker once again. When President Trump commanded the defeat of ISIS, took out al-Baghdadi and Soleimani, and paved the way for peace in the Middle East, that beacon started to glow. When he negotiated historic trade deals with Canada, Mexico, Japan, and China, bringing back thousands of manufacturing jobs to America, that beacon shined bright once again for the world to see. America, it's all on the line. President Trump believes in you. He emancipates and lifts you up to live your American dream. You are capable, you are qualified, you are powerful, and you have the ability to choose your life and determine your destiny. Don't let the Democrats take you for granted. Don't let them step on you. Don't let them destroy your families, your lives, and your future. Don't let them kill future generations because they told you and brainwashed you and fed you lies that you weren't good enough. Like my parents, you can achieve your American dream. You can be that shining example to the world. Manifest and be the change in this country that you dream, that you hope, that you believe in. Stand for an American president who is fearless, who believes in you, and who loves this country and will fight for her. President Trump is the leader who will rebuild the promise of America and ensure that every citizen can realize their American dream. Ladies and gentlemen, leaders and fighters for freedom and liberty and the American dream, the best is yet to come. Kimberly Guilfoyle, fierce speech there. If you don't know who she is, she is the national campaign finance chair of the Trump campaign, also the girlfriend of Donald Trump Jr., who we're going to hear from in our next hour, um, the former wife of Gavin Newsom, the Democratic governor of California. It calls this a battle for the soul of America, echoing the theme that we saw from Joe Biden last week and picking up on the McCluskeys on the theme of uh, riots in the streets, who they talked about mobs spurred on by their allies in the media. I want to bring in Tara Moran, our chief national correspondent for more on this interior. If you look at the last three or four uh, speeches we heard, we see recurring themes there, unrest in the streets, violence. The Democrats want to defund the police. They're being enabled uh, by the media. And it made me think back to Richard Nixon's campaign in 1968. The difference here is that Richard Nixon was a challenger, not an incumbent. That's right. It's a different situation that way, and it's a different America. But there's no question that was a law and order campaign that Richard Nixon ran. Uh, so is this one. But a, a different country in many ways. Nixon talked on the night that he accepted the Republican nomination of the cities in flames, of sirens in the night, and that he wanted to speak for the non-shouters and the non-demonstrators, the silent majority. And he connected with enough people because the country was engulfed in far worse demonstrations than anything we've seen, really, uh, for several years in the mid-1960s, anti-war demonstrations, demonstrations for racial justice uh, that were exhausting to many Americans. To but this is a different country. It's, uh, to assassinations as well. It was total chaos, it seemed. Uh, this Black Lives Matter moment seems more thoughtful. It, with the edge of the demonstrations being marked by violence, the country is engaging this subject much more than frightened by it and rejecting it, which is what it felt like in 1968. And I want to bring in Byron Pitts for more on, on this as well. And of course, we just heard those speeches on this theme of violence uh, in the streets, on the police. It comes at a time when the streets of Wisconsin are in flame tonight after the shooting of Jacob Blake, a uh, young, young black man shot in the back, I think, seven times by police in Wisconsin. They're trying, still trying to figure out exactly what happened, but we know he was shot in the back. We all saw the video. Yeah, shot in the back with his uh, three young children in the car. George, in listening to tonight, it, it, it reminds me of, of the divide that exists in America, that people have access to the same information but see it very differently. The one couple, the last speaker, talked about mobs, uh, where last week the Democrats talked about peaceful protesters. Same people, but saw in very different lights. 
And talking about and talking about you know the economy and and, and the, the great emphasis tonight about how black unemployment is is at is at record lows. Now I, I know we live in an age now where nuance is not fashionable, but here's the reality that all all unemployment is down. But the issue is that black unemployment is still twice what it is for white unemployment. Uh, in fact, that decline began in 2011, and it's it's gone forward. In fact, it slowed down and and it slowed down statistically since Donald Trump took office. But yeah, George, it's it, it's it's this is a fight for the soul of America. Uh, Republicans see it one way; they see angry mobs, scary people in the street. Democrats see it differently. Protesters who aren't happy with where America is now. So, so the, How about we're seeing Biden? real stark contrast as to what the Republicans, I, the argument they're making, and the argument that Democrats make. If I can follow you up right there, Vernon Jones said he's a Democrat. He's a Democrat who's endorsed Donald Trump. Did anything you hear from him strike a chord or, they, or make you think that this is something that could appeal to enough black Americans to make the difference for Donald Trump? George, in a word, no. Uh, I lived in DeKalb County. I still have friends and family there. And so I know that, that Vernon, J Vernon Jones politically is a very lonely man in DeKalb County, which has a very large black population. And, and as, as you got, were saying with Terry earlier, this is an argument that Republicans have been making since Richard Nixon, that there is place in our tent for African Americans. So either the salespeople have been poor or the product isn't that good because clearly black Americans have not, the majority, have not embraced that argument from Richard Nixon to today. Okay, Byron, thanks very much. Tom Yamas, your thoughts on this hour? You know, we're covering the Republican National Convention, but I think we've just entered the MAGA show, George. And I say that because a lot of the speakers we're hearing from tonight are heroes to that very conservative Trump world. People like Charlie Kirk, who started this from Turning Points. He was the first speaker tonight. The McCloskeys. And then we just heard from Kimberly Guilfoyle as well. And we'll hear from Don Jr. tonight. Again, it's called the Republican National Convention, but it's quickly turning into the MAGA show, with the exception of Representative Jim Jordan and Andrew Pollack, who gave very powerful testimonies. This is really to fire up the Trump space. A lot of people may think that the McCloskeys are what's wrong with America. People in this space think the McCloskeys are heroes. They think Don Jr. is a hero. He's the ambassador to sort of those conservative fringe movements. And it's interesting, because the president said we're going to have a very positive convention. But what we're hearing, though, are very dark, dark aspects to what will happen if Democrats win. Uh, they seem to be having sort of a mixed message with the programming, because at the end of the night, we're going to hear from Senator Tim Scott, who's not really part of that group. But Matt made this point earlier. If they want to expand the tent, it's going to be tough with some of these speakers. That could be Nikki Haley's job as well. She's coming up in the next hour as well, the former ambassador to the U.N. for President Trump. As you said, Donald Trump Jr. will be speaking as well. We're also going to see more from President Trump. It's all coming up in our next hour. Stay with us.
This is an ABC News special. We will make America great again. Just four years ago, Donald Trump stepped into the spotlight. With the economy, coronavirus, and unrest in America on the minds of voters, another unconventional convention. This week, the Republicans get their turn. Tonight, Nikki Haley, Donald Trump Jr., and Senator Tim Scott make the case for why there should be a Trump second term. Live from New York City and across the country, the Republican National Convention. Now reporting, Chief Anchor George Stephanopoulos. Good evening and welcome to our special coverage of the Republican National Convention. Coming off the Democrats' virtual convention last week, it's the GOP's turn to take the stage and they are coming from behind. Joe Biden holds a stable lead nationwide and in those key battleground states, it's been that way for weeks. The big question for the president and his party, can they shake up the race in these four nights of prime time, cast a new light on Trump, raise new doubts about Biden? One thing is clear, the president will do it his way, appearing day and night all through the convention. He's given three speeches already today, the first after the roll call of states in Charlotte officially made him the nominee. Michigan, the Great Lakes state, is going to cast all 73 votes for President Donald J. Trump. Florida's 122 delegate votes to the next president of the United States. Thank you. I just want to thank everybody for this incredible support. Be very, very careful. This is going to be, and I really believe this, this is the most important election in the history of our country. Yes, it is. Don't let them take it away from you. Don't let them take it away. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you. Talking about what's at stake there, echoing in some ways what President Obama said last week at the Democratic Convention. He actually went on for another hour after that. I want to bring in Mary Bruce at the Mellon Auditorium in Washington, D.C., where a lot of the events are going to be held. And one thing is clear, Mary, at this convention, the Republicans hope to draw a contrast with the Democrats on both substance and stagecraft. George, the Trump team wants this to look and feel very different from the Democrats' convention. The reality star president wants to put on a show, and he is going to play the starring role here, figuring prominently every night. They want this to feel more like a traditional convention and to be more regal and grand. The speakers are intended to look like they are all live, and the tone is supposed to be different as well. Trump said that the Democrats' convention was too dark and downtrodden. These next four days are supposed to be more optimistic and hopeful, but based on what we've seen so far today, there are questions about whether the Trump team are going to stick to that plan. The president kicking things off today gave a speech full of grievances, and he has been painting a fairly apocalyptic picture of what will happen if he is not reelected. George. Okay, thanks very much. And David Muir, we're about to hear from the president for the first time in this hour, maybe striking a softer tone here, bringing out hostages who he says he helped uh, take from captivity. Yes, he wants to turn to the parts of his record he believes he can sell to the American people. And, and to underscore what Mary just said, the president has said that Democrats held the darkest, angriest, gloomiest convention in American history. We know this is going to be a family fair. At least six members of the Trump family will make the case uh, for President Trump this week. Kimberly Guilfoyle moments ago, Don Jr.'s girlfriend, saying, America, it's all on the line. Don't let the Democrats destroy your lives or kill future generations. So uh, they, they said there would be a more hopeful tone. The president said that, but uh, it's going to be a real test in these days ahead. And we're about to hear from the president right now. Let's listen into the virtual floor freeing American hostages we have six incredible people who were held hostage by various countries and I'm very pleased to let everybody know that we brought back over 50 hostages from 22 different countries we worked very hard on it ambassador O'Brien and others and I will tell you, we, uh, we're very proud of the job we did. But I'd like to ask maybe uh, Pastor Brunson to say a few words so we can go through and just give us a little history of what happened and how is life treating you. I was held in Turkey uh, for two years. And uh, you took unprecedented steps, actually, to secure my release. And your administration really fought for me. And I, don't, I think if you hadn't done that, I may still be in Turkey. Good. So I'm very for grateful. 28 for years, right? They had you there we're, for, we're, they had you scheduled for a long time, Andrew. Yes. We had to get you back. And I, I have to say that, to me, President Erdogan was very good. And I know they had you scheduled for a long time, and you were a very innocent person. 
And uh, he ultimately, after we had a few conversations, he agreed. So we appreciate that, and we appreciate the people of Turkey. And you still appreciate the people of Turkey, I understand, right? We love the Turkish people. We still That's great. Us. It's great to have you back, Andrew. Thank you. Please. Mr. President, thank you for having me. Thank My you. name is Sam Goodwin. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. I was held in Syria for 63 days. And uh, I'm, I think I speak for my fellow former hostages and detainees here when I say I'm as grateful as I've ever been for anything to be home safely. And uh, thank you for the invitation and opportunity to be here. Uh, particularly, Ambassador O'Brien was incredibly supportive and helpful to my family. And I uh, can't say enough nice things about him. Thank you for promoting him. Good. And uh, just really happy to be here. Thank you. We got you back. You got me back, yeah. We got you all back. And we have some more that we're working on right now to get back that we better do. Please, go ahead. My name is Michael White, Mr. President. I do, once again, it's an honor to be here, honor to meet you in person. Basically, what had happened with me is I went traveled over to the country of Iran. It turned out it was a major, major trap, and I was uh, apprehended there. I went through a lot in their injustice system, in the Iranian justice system. Iran is an oppressive, extortionist, terrorist regime. You know what I'm talking about. Um, but what you did, sir, is you were able to get me out of that prison record time. It was amazing. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you. Really appreciate daughter's it. all mine. Please. Yeah, my name is Josh Holt. This is my wife, Tammy. Yes. Uh, we were held hostage in Venezuela for two years. I know very well. <laughs> um, and you, you helped us get out. Uh, and Senator Hatch worked with you very well on that as well. Um, and it was a, a great honor to be able to meet you right when we got back. And I remember a lot of people asked me, what was it like meeting President Trump? And I just said, I was, I was blown away. I'd just gotten released after two years. Then I'm shaking the hand of the president in the Oval Office. So I don't really remember a whole lot of it. So it's nice to meet you again. And uh, it's been great. It's been great to be back, helping people through through situations that they've gone through, and now we have to start our family. Well, the great people of Utah really wanted me to do something about the two of you, and we were able to do it, and a little bit of a miracle, I think, frankly. It was. Because it was a very hostile period, and uh, we appreciate everybody working so hard with us, but we were able to get you both back, and are you living in Utah now, I yeah, hope? We're still living in Utah. That's good. We'll say hello to the folks in Utah, because they're great people. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Please. I'm Brian there. Spent an unexpected trip there in India. I was not going to India. I was going through India to Nepal, where yeah. I've been working for the last 18 years. But on behalf of my family and myself, thank you, uh, President Trump, for getting us out and getting us home. The darkest moment of our whole time together, uh, your letter to my wife came. And it really gave her the hope and the peace. And great. from that time forward, as more people got involved, especially the ambassador there in uh, India, things became more peaceful and, and the hope uh, was there for the last four months that we really wouldn't get to come home because they had planned on keeping me for uh, three to five years. The, the original charge thing was three to five years right. and, and that was cleared and then they came up with new charges to do a seven year uh, term. Well, India for, responded very well to my request. Good. So we appreciate that. And we appreciate, appreciate everything y'all did. Thank you all for being with us. We have a few more people we want to get back, and we will get them back, and they'll be back very soon. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Great conversation there in the White House with President Trump. I want to bring in Chris Christie uh, to set the stage a little bit here for the Republican convention. Okay, this is the first 10 minutes or so here in prime time. We've had about an hour and a half before that. What do you make of what you've seen so far? What do you think is the most important thing the president needs to do this week? Uh, the most important thing the president needs to do this week is to lay out his agenda for the next four years. And to to use that as the contrast point. We were discussing this earlier, Rob and I were, about the different ways you can go about this. You can attack someone's character in a campaign. You can go after policy in a campaign. You've got to make a choice as to what you want to do. Um, and in this case, with two folks 74 years of age and older, you can also question, are they up for the job? And so I think the president has to, to be successful, go on the policy lane and make that contrast between what the Democrats were talking about for months through their primaries and what he wants to do with the country. If he goes on to the type of campaign he ran against Hillary Clinton in 2016, it will be a loser because people do not feel about Joe Biden the way they felt about Hillary Clinton on a personal level. They're just different. They're seen as different. And so I think the attacking in that way will be a failure if he does it. If he attacks on policy issues and forwards his agenda, I think he can have a successful week and a successful campaign. If he doesn't, 
then I think he's got a problem. Yvette, in the first hour and a half of the convention, we certainly saw a sharp contrast being drawn on the issues of policing, uh, the Black Lives Matter protests, law and, and order, and those were harsh. Oh, yeah. I heard mobs said many times. I heard Marxists said many times. I heard radicals said many times. And honestly, I don't think most Americans feel that way. You think about the multiracial movement that was powered by Black Lives Matter, not just black and brown people, but the moms that were protecting people, the white folks who are out there protecting people. I don't think that most people characterize this movement that way. And so I think he's talking to a very small group of people who don't relate. And unfortunately, I don't think that's a winning strategy for him. Rahm Emanuel, the Democrats got fairly high marks for their convention last week. Hard to know what the bounce is going to be like, if you can even get a bounce in this day and age. What do the Republicans need to do? Well, I pick up on this point. There are two models here. One is the Reagan-Clinton model, Morning in America, Building a Bridge to the 21st Century, or the Bush 43 and Obama model, which is contrast, which is what they did for reelect. I got to be honest, what I've heard today so far reminds me of the inaugural address of Carnage. And he's not picking either one of these models for a reelect campaign. And I think if, unless they make this a choice, that's clear about the differences in policy and direction, this is going to implode on itself. This is not, if this is the corner of he healthy and happy, we're in a really dark spot right now. And I think the notion that they're going to offer an alternative, more optimistic message has yet to come across at this point. And I think it's then therefore failing for what it has to do. Sarah Fagan. Well, we're going to hear tonight from Tim Scott and Nikki Haley, two bright uh, rising stars in the Republican Party. I think they're going to paint a different picture of Donald Trump's presidency, the things that he has done well. I think one of the best moments in this evening so far was a video played earlier about uh, the Trump response to COVID. You know, the reality is the country did do a lot. They rallied around PPE. They produced ventilators. We've seen record vaccination. It hasn't been perfect. There's some things that have gone wrong. But uh, this is where Trump needs to focus. He needs to focus on the things he's done well and talk about what he's going to do uh, over the next four years. Okay, Nikki Haley is coming up. She's next along with Donald Trump Jr. And then Senator Tim Scott will be right back.
the Republican National Convention. Here again, George Stephanopoulos. Welcome back to our coverage of the first night of the Republican Convention. I want to bring in our Chief White House Correspondent, John Carl. John, of course, every minute of this convention is planned out. The President and his team have had a tougher time over the last several days with the stories that are coming from outside this convention. Oh, it's been a brutal series of stories, George. On the one hand, you had Steve Bannon, the president's former campaign chairman and chief strategist in the White House, arrested, uh, accused of essentially trying to defraud uh, Trump supporters. You've had the president's own sister, uh, Marion uh, Trump Berry, uh, recorded by his niece uh, talking about how the president is a essentially a pathological liar uh, and has not done anything to lead the country. I mean, if you listen to those extraordinary tapes of the president's elder sister, uh, the, the, the judge, a former judge, uh, it sounds like a harsher criticism than anything we heard at the Democratic convention. John Carl, thanks very much. Now we'll hear from the former U.N. ambassador, former governor of South Carolina, Nikki Haley. Good evening. I'm Nikki Haley, and it's great to be back at the Republican National Convention. I'll start with a little story. It's about an American ambassador to the United Nations, and it's about a speech she gave to this convention. She called for the re-election of the Republican president she served, and she called out his Democratic opponent, a former vice president from a failed administration. That ambassador said, and I quote, Democrats always blame America first. The year was 1984. The president was Ronald Reagan, and Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick's words are just as true today. Joe Biden and the Democrats are still blaming America first. Donald Trump has always put America first, and he has earned four more years as president. It was an honor of a lifetime to serve as the United States Ambassador to the United Nations. Now, the UN is not for the faint of heart. It's a place where dictators, murderers, and thieves denounce America and then put their hands out and demand that we pay their bills. Well, President Trump put an end to all of that. With his leadership, we did what Barack Obama and Joe Biden refused to do. We stood up for America and we stood against our enemies. Obama and Biden let North Korea threaten America. President Trump rejected that weakness and we passed the toughest sanctions on North Korea in history. Obama and Biden let Iran get away with murder and literally sent them a plane full of cash. President Trump did the right thing and ripped up the Iran nuclear deal. Obama and Biden led the United Nations to denounce our friend and ally, Israel. President Trump moved our embassy to Jerusalem, and when the UN tried to condemn us, I was proud to cast the American veto. This president has a record of strength and success. The former vice president has a record of weakness and failure. Joe Biden is good for Iran and ISIS, great for communist China, and he's a godsend to everyone who wants America to apologize, abstain, and abandon our values. Donald Trump takes a different approach. He's tough on China, and he took on ISIS and won, and he tells the world what it needs to hear. At home, the president is the clear choice on jobs and the economy. He's moved America forward, while Joe Biden has held America back. When Joe was VP, I was governor of the great state of South Carolina. We had a pretty good run. Manufacturers of all kinds flocked to our state from overseas, creating tens of thousands of American jobs. People were referring to South Carolina as the beast of the Southeast, which I loved. Everything we did happened in spite of Joe Biden and his old boss. We cut taxes, they raised them. We slashed red tape. They piled on more mandates. And when we brought in good paying jobs, Biden and Obama sued us. I fought back and they gave up. 
A Biden-Harris administration would be much, much worse. Last time, Joe's boss was Obama. This time, it would be Pelosi, Sanders, and the squad. Their vision for America is socialism, and we know that socialism has failed everywhere. They want to tell Americans how to live and what to think. They want a government takeover of health care. They want to ban fracking and kill millions of jobs. They want massive tax hikes on working families. Joe Biden and the socialist left would be a disaster for our economy. But President Trump is leading a new era of opportunity. Before communist China gave us the coronavirus, we were breaking economic records left and right. The pandemic has set us back, but not for long. President Trump brought our economy back before, and he will bring it back again. There's one more important area where our president is right. He knows that political correctness and cancel culture are dangerous and just plain wrong. In much of the Democratic Party, it's now fashionable to say that America is racist. That is a lie. America is not a racist country. This is personal for me. I am the proud daughter of Indian immigrants. They came to America and settled in a small southern town. My father wore a turban. My mother wore a sari. I was a brown girl in a black and white world. We faced discrimination and hardship, but my parents never gave in to grievance and hate. My mom built a successful business. My dad taught 30 years at a historically black college and the people of South Carolina chose me as their first minority and first female governor. America is a story that's a work in progress. Now is the time to build on that progress and make America even freer, fairer, and better for everyone. That's why it's so tragic to see so much of the Democratic Party turning a blind eye towards riots and rage. The American people know we can do better, and of course we value and respect every black life. The black cops who've been shot in the line of duty, they matter. The black small business owners who've watched their life's work go up in flames, they matter. The black kids who've been gunned down on the playground, their lives matter too. And their lives are being ruined and stolen by the violence on our streets. It doesn't have to be like this. It wasn't like this in South Carolina five years ago. Our state came face to face with evil. A white supremacist walked into Mother Emanuel Church during Bible study. Twelve African Americans pulled up a chair and prayed with him for an hour. Then he began to shoot. After that horrific tragedy, we didn't turn against each other. We came together, black and white, Democrat and Republican. Together, we made the hard choices needed to heal and removed a divisive symbol peacefully and respectfully. What happened then should give us hope now. America isn't perfect, but the principles we hold dear are perfect. If there's one thing I've learned, it's that even on our worst day, we are blessed to live in America. It's time to keep that blessing alive for the next generation. This president and this party are committed to that noble task. We seek a nation that rises together, not falls apart in anarchy and anger. We know that the only way to overcome America's challenges is to embrace America's strengths. We are striving to reach a brighter future where every child goes to a world-class school chosen by their parents, where every family lives in a safe community with good jobs, where every entrepreneur has the freedom to achieve and inspire, where every believer can worship without fear and every life is protected where every girl and boy, every woman and man of every race and religion has the best shot at the best life. 
In this election, we must choose the only candidate who has and who will continue delivering on that vision. President Trump and Vice President Pence have my support, and America has our promise. We will build on the progress of our past and unlock the promise of our future. That future starts when the American people re-elect President Donald Trump. Thank you, good night, and may God always bless America. Donald Trump Jr. We're here tonight to talk about the great American story, to talk about this country we all love, this land of promise and opportunity, of heroes and greatness. Just a few short months ago, we were seeing the American dream become a reality for more of our citizens than ever before. The greatest prolonged economic expansion in American history, the lowest unemployment rate in nearly 50 years the lowest unemployment rates ever for black Americans, Hispanic Americans, women, and pretty much every other demographic group. And then, courtesy of the Chinese Communist Party, the virus struck. The president quickly took action and shut down travel from China. Joe Biden and his Democrat allies called my father a racist and a xenophobe for doing it. They put political correctness ahead of the safety and security of the American people. Fortunately, as the virus began to spread, the president acted quickly and ensured ventilators got to hospitals that needed them most. He delivered PP&E to our brave frontline workers, and he rallied the mighty American private sector to tackle this new challenge. There's more work to do, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Job gains are outpacing what the so-called experts expected. But Biden's radical left-wing policies would stop our economic recovery cold. He's already talking about shutting the country down again. It's madness. Democrats claim to be for workers, but they've spent the entire pandemic trying to sneak a tax break for millionaires in Democrat states into the COVID relief bill. Then they attacked my father for suspending the payroll tax for middle-class workers. In fact, if you think about it, Joe Biden's entire economic platform seems designed to crush the working man and woman. He supported the worst trade deals in the history of the planet. He voted for the NAFTA nightmare. Down the tubes went our auto industry. He pushed for TPP. Goodbye, manufacturing jobs. Beijing Biden is so weak on China that the intelligence community recently assessed that the Chinese Communist Party favors Biden. They know he'll weaken us both economically and on a world stage. Biden also wants to bring in more illegal immigrants to take jobs from American citizens. His open border policies would drive wages down for Americans at a time when low-income workers were getting real wage increases for the first time in modern history. He's pledged to repeal the Trump tax cuts, which were the biggest in our country. After eight years of Obama and Biden's slow growth, Trump's policies have been like rocket fuel to the economy and especially to the middle class. Biden has promised to take that money back out of your pocket and keep it in the swamp. That makes sense, though, considering Joe Biden is basically the Loch Ness Monster of the swamp. For the past half century, he's been lurking around in there. He sticks his head up every now and then to run for president. Then he disappears and doesn't do much in between. So if you're looking for hope, look to the man who did what the failed Obama-Biden administration never could do and built the greatest economy our country has ever seen. And President Trump will do it again. We will be stronger than ever because when we put our mind to it, there is no obstacle that America can't surmount. Except there's a difference this time. In the past, both parties believed in the goodness of America. We agreed on where we wanted to go. We just disagreed on how to get there. This time, the other party is attacking the very principles on which our nation was founded. Freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, 
the rule of law. Thomas Jefferson famously said, I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. Our founders believed there was nothing more important than protecting our God-given right to think for ourselves. Now the left, they're trying to cancel all of those founders. They don't seem to understand this important principle. In order to improve in the future, we must learn from our past, not erase it. So we're not going to tear down monuments and forget the people who built our great nation. Instead, we will learn from our past so we don't repeat any mistakes. And we will work tirelessly to improve the lives of all Americans. Joe Biden and the radical left are now coming for our freedom of speech. They want to bully us into submission. If they get their way, it will no longer be the silent majority. It will be the silenced majority. This has to stop. Freedom of expression used to be a liberal value, at least before the radical left took over. Now the Republican Party is the home of free speech, the place where anyone from any background can speak their mind and may the best ideas win. People of faith are under attack. You're not allowed to go to church, but mass chaos in the streets gets a pass. It's almost like this election is shaping up to be church, work, and school versus rioting, looting, and vandalism. Or, in the words of Biden and the Democrats, peaceful protesting. Anarchists have been flooding our streets, and Democrat mayors are ordering the police to stand down. Small businesses across America, many of them minority-owned, are being torched by mobs. The Democrat mayors pretend it's not happening. They actually called it a summer of love. And that brings me to another important principle. Every American must be free to live without fear of violence in your country, in your communities, and in your homes. All men and women are created equal and must be treated equally under the law. That's why we must put an end to racism, and we must ensure that any police officer who abuses their powers is held accountable. What happened to George Floyd is a disgrace, and if you know a police officer, you know they agree with that too. But we cannot lose sight of the fact that our police are American heroes. They deserve our deepest appreciation. Because no matter what the Democrats say, you and I both know when we dial 911, we don't want it going to voicemail. So defunding the police is not an option. Everything starts with safety and security. You can't have anything else without it. You can't focus on building a better future for your children without the peace of mind that they can study safely in their classrooms, play safely in their neighborhoods, and sleep safely in their beds. But safety is only the beginning. Trump's America is a land of opportunity, a place of promise. I was fortunate enough to grow up in a family that could afford the best schools and the finest universities. But a great education cannot be the exclusive right of the rich and powerful. It must be accessible to all. And that's why my dad is pro-school choice. That's why he's called education access the civil rights issue, not just of our time, but of all time. It is unacceptable that too many African-American and Hispanic-American children are stuck in bad schools just because of their zip code. Donald Trump will not stand for it. If Democrats really wanted to help minorities and underserved communities, instead of bowing to big money union bosses, they'd let parents choose what school is best for their kids. They'd limit immigration to protect American workers. They'd support the police who protect our neighborhoods. They'd learn how to negotiate trade deals that prioritize America's interest for a change. They'd end the endless wars and quit sending our young people to solve problems in foreign lands. They'd cut taxes for families and workers. They'd create opportunity zones that drive investment into inner cities. In other words, if Democrats cared for the forgotten men and women of our country, they'd do exactly what President Trump is doing. America is the greatest country on earth, but my father's entire worldview revolves around the idea that we can always do even better. Imagine the life you want to have 
one with a great job, a beautiful home, a perfect family. You can have it. Imagine the country you want to live in, one with true, equal opportunity, where hard work pays off and justice is served with compassion and without partiality. You can have it. Imagine a world where the evils of communism and radical Islamic terrorism are not given a chance to spread, where heroes are celebrated and the good guys win. You can have it. That is the life, that is the country, that is the world that Donald Trump and the Republican Party are after. And yes, you can have it. Because unlike Joe Biden and the radical left Democrats, our party is open to everyone. It starts by rejecting radicals who want to drag us into the dark and embracing the man who represents a bright and beautiful future for all. It starts by re-electing Donald J. Trump, President of the United States. Thank you, and God bless America. Donald Trump Jr. speaking for his father right there, also taking on the role you often see on the opening nights of the convention, attack dog on behalf of his father against what he called Joe Biden and the radical left Democrats, also called him Beijing Biden. I want to bring Cecilia Vega, our senior White House correspondent. Uh, is the Biden team choosing to respond to what was so far the fiercest attack of this convention? Well, not yet. I'm waiting to hear back right now as we speak, George, but we are seeing the party in general responding in pretty quick real time right there in Washington around the corner from the Mellon Auditorium where, uh, where the Republicans are holding this convention, so-called convention tonight. Uh, you can see right there that, that image that they're projecting on a nearby building. It's calling into question the number of uh, COVID deaths and, and COVID cases under President Trump. And that's the same sentiment that we are seeing uh, from Joe Biden's Twitter uh, account just a few minutes ago calling uh, out, out the president for these corona cases. Uh, but, but we are seeing a different tack being taken by the Biden camp right now, uh, much different than what we saw, at least from President Trump in comparison to last week when the Democrats Democrats were in the spotlight. There were no in-person uh, events scheduled with the candidate today or the, the, the or Kamala Harris for that matter. Uh, it's a much more traditional approach. They're letting the Republicans have their moment, at, at least right now. That's what we're seeing. Perhaps the most significant thing that they've done, though, George, today was release this list of two dozen or so names, uh, former GOP uh, members of Congress, GOP members, former members of Congress, uh, who are now endorsing Joe Biden for president. Among them, the leader of them, Arizona Senator uh, Jeff Flake, who really came out swinging to Today and said that, 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 that Joe Biden would be a better conservative uh, than Donald Trump if he were elected in this, this election, George. Cecilia Vega, thanks very much. Senator Tim Scott is coming up. We'll be right back. Let me speak answers.
And we are back covering the first night of the Republican convention. We're about to hear from Senator Tim Scott. I want to bring in Lindsey Davis. Lindsey, so far tonight we've heard a lot of talk about violence in the streets, unrest right now, Black Lives Matter, the police. No talk about what's roiling the streets of Kenosha, Wisconsin right and, now. And what's interesting, if I can, I'm just hung up a little bit about Nikki Haley, a comment that she made, America is not a racist country. I think that that's a statement that a lot of black people, black and brown people would take umbrage with, including Donald J. Trump. I mean, he said we must put an end to racism. But while we're talking about what we're hearing about, what we're not hearing about are those protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, where the 29-year-old uh, Jacob Blake was shot multiple times in the back by police. Um, and yet, while we're not hearing about that, we are hearing from the McCoskeys, the, the couple in St. Louis that were brandishing their arms against Black Lives Matter protesters. If you look at the numbers, about 3% of Americans, black Americans, say that they think that President Trump is doing a good job with reducing discrimination of blacks in criminal justice system. Thank and here comes Senator Tim Scott right now. That is going to play out I'm overnight. Senator Tim Scott from the great state of South Carolina. To all of you tuning in and participating in the political process, God bless you. This isn't how I picture tonight, but our country is experiencing something none of us envisioned. From a global pandemic to the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, 2020 has tested our nation in ways we haven't seen for decades. But regardless of the challenges presented to us, Every four years, Americans come together to vote, to share stories of what makes our nation strong and the lessons we have learned that can strengthen it for further generations. Because while this election is between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, it is not solely about Donald Trump and Joe Biden. It's about the promise of America. It's about you and me, our challenges and heartbreaks, hopes and dreams. It's about how we respond when tackling critical issues like police reform, when Democrats called our work a token effort and walked out of the room during negotiations because they wanted the issue more than they wanted a solution. Do we want a society that breeds success or a culture that cancels everything it even slightly disagrees with? I know where I stand, because you see, I am living my mother's American dream. My parents divorced when I was seven years old, and we moved in with my grandparents into a two-bedroom home with me, my mom, and my brother sharing a room and one bed. My mom worked 16 hours a day to keep food on the table and a roof over our heads. She knew that if we could find the opportunity, bigger things would come. I thought I had to use football to succeed in life, and my focus on academics faded away. My freshman year, I failed out. I failed four subjects, Spanish, English, world geography, and even civics. Trust me, though, after seven years in the Senate, I know I'm not the only one in Congress who failed civics. But even while I was failing the ninth grade, my mother always said to me, Timmy, if you would just shoot for the moon, even if you miss, you'll be among the stars. She never lost faith in me, even when I lost faith in myself. Because of her encouragement, I went to summer school and caught up. The next year, I met my mentor, John Moniz, a Chick-fil-A operator. John saw something in me that I could not see in myself and started teaching me valuable life lessons. Like having a job would be a good thing, but creating jobs would be even better. That having an income could change my lifestyle, but creating a profit could change my community. He planted the seeds of what would become Opportunity Zones. This initiative that the President and I worked together on is now bringing more than $75 billion of private sector investment into distressed communities. I took those lessons to heart and started putting the pieces of my life back together. I realized a quality education is the closest thing to magic in America. That's why I fight to this day for school choice, to make sure every child in every neighborhood has a quality education. I don't care if it's a public, private, charter, virtual, or a homeschool. When a parent has a choice, their kid has a better chance. And the president has fought alongside me on that. Later in life, I started my own small business. 
That's why I know it is critical for us to have a tax code that encourages growth. We actually saw revenues to the Treasury increase after we lowered taxes in 2017. Rest assured, the Democrats do not want you to know that. After starting my small business and spending some time in local government, I decided to run for Congress in 2010. The district is based in Charleston, South Carolina, where the Civil War started against a son of our legendary Senator Strom Thurmond. You may be asking yourself, how does a poor black kid from a single parent household run and win in a race crowded with Republicans against a Thurmond? Because of the evolution of the Southern heart. In an overwhelmingly white district, the voters judged me not on the color of my skin, but on the content of my character. We live in a world that only wants you to believe in the bad news, racially, economically, and culturally polarizing news. The truth is, our nation's arc always bends back towards fairness. We are not fully where we want to be, but I thank God Almighty we are not where we used to be. We are always striving to be better. When we stumble, and we will, we pick ourselves back up and try again. We don't give in to cancel culture or the radical and factually baseless belief that things are worse today than in the 1860s or the 1960s. We have work to do, but I believe in the goodness of America. The promise that all men and all women are created equal. And if you're watching tonight, I'm betting you do too. Over the past four years, we have made tremendous progress towards that promise. President Trump built the most inclusive economy ever. Seven million jobs created pre-COVID-19, and two-thirds of them went to women, African Americans, and Hispanics. The first new major effort to tackle poverty in a generation, Opportunity Zones. We put hard-earned tax dollars back in people's pockets by cutting their taxes, especially for single-parent households like the one I grew up in, cutting single mothers' taxes 70 percent on average. President Trump supported these tax cuts for those single moms and other working families and signed these policies into law, and our nation is better off for it. So I'm going to ask you, the American people, not to simply look at what the candidates say, but to look back at what they've done. This election is about your future, and it is critical to paint a full picture of the records of Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Joe Biden said if a black man didn't vote for him, he wasn't truly black. Joe Biden said black people are a monolithic community. It was Joe Biden who said poor kids can be just as smart as white kids. And while his words are one thing, his actions take it to a whole new level. In 1994, Biden led the charge on a crime bill that put millions of black Americans behind bars. President Trump's criminal justice reform law fixed many of the disparities Biden created and made our system more fair and just for all Americans. Joe Biden also failed our nation's historically black colleges and universities, heaping blame on them as they fought to ensure our young folks had access to higher education. Once again, to clean up Joe Biden's mess, President Trump signed into law historically high funding for HBCUs, as well as a bill to give them permanent funding for the first time ever. And now Joe Biden wants to come for your pocketbooks. Unless, of course, you're a blue state millionaire. I'm serious. That's one of their solutions for the pandemic. They want to take more money from your pocket and give it to Manhattan elites and Hollywood moguls so they get a tax break. Republicans, however, 
passed President Trump's once-in-a-generation tax reform bill that lowered taxes for single moms, working families, and those in need. So when it comes to what Joe Biden says he'll do, look at his actions, look at his policies, look at what he already did and what he didn't do while he's been in Washington for 47 years. Ladies and gentlemen, people don't always see those failures because they think we're having a policy debate on two sides of an issue. That is not what is happening. Our side is working on policy, while Joe Biden's radical Democrats are trying to permanently transform what it means to be an American. Make no mistake, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris want a cultural revolution, a fundamentally different America. If we let them, they will turn our country into a socialist utopia. And history has taught us that path only leads to pain and misery, especially for hardworking people hoping to rise. Instead, we must focus on the promise of the American journey. I know that journey well. My grandfather's 99th birthday would have been tomorrow. Growing up, he had to cross the street if a white person was coming. He suffered the indignity of being forced out of school as a third grader to pick cotton, and he never learned to read or write. Yet, he lived long enough to see his grandson become the first African American to be elected to both the United States House and the United States Senate in the history of this country. Our family went from cotton to Congress in one lifetime. And that's why I believe the next American century can be better than the last. There are millions of families just like mine all across this nation full of potential seeking to live the American dream. And I'm here tonight to tell you that supporting the Republican ticket gives you the best chance of making that dream a reality. God bless you. And Father, please continue blessing the United States of America. God bless. No crowd for Tim Scott, but that was a classic keynote speech here at this Republican convention. He talked about believing in the goodness of America. He did take some shots at Joe Biden, no question about that, but in some ways, the most personal and the most optimistic speech so far of the night, Byron Pitts. Oh, George, that's right. It was personal and it was positive. He's an evangelical Christian, so certainly he, he gave a, a nod to the Lord. It's interesting. I, I think in many ways, in Donald Trump's Republican Party, Tim Scott is there at Kamala Harris, that he has comparable historic heft. He is the uh, only black Republican senator in the U.S. Senate. He's the first black uh, senator from the South since Reconstruction. And he's talked about some of the things that, that Joe Biden has said. Senator Scott was one of the people, Republicans, who quickly came out and criticized President Trump after his comments about Charlottesville when the president posted that, that white power statement. Scott also criticized him. So he makes the case for Donald Trump. And as you said, George, he made it in a positive, eloquent, kind way that there is room in Donald Trump's Republican Party for brown and black people. We'll see how, how effective it is. He talked a lot about, the, about opportunities and employment. But, you know, George, I, when he said that, I thought about Breonna Taylor. Breonna Taylor uh, had a good job, but that didn't keep, her, didn't keep her alive. Both of them, John, had a good job in Texas, and he lost his life. So I, I think it, it's a compelling argument. It's a positive spin. Uh, but I, I think there's some question as, as to how far it will resonate in brown and black communities. That's what we're going to be watching over the coming days. Lindsey Davis, uh, he did, as I said, he did take some shots at Joe Biden, including those comments that Joe Biden has made in the past, paraphrasing them, that have caused consternation in the black community. Uh, first, just want to say, I think that he had a powerful line when he talked about how his family went from cotton to Congress in one lifetime. Uh, but then he did lay out what he described as Joe Biden's failures very swiftly. Joe Biden said if a black man didn't vote for him, he wasn't truly black. Joe Biden said black people are a monolithic community. 
Joe Biden said poor kids can be just as smart as white kids. He went on and on and really uh, made a compelling case. President Trump is, after all, though, a president who has said that he's done more for the black community than anyone and more for the black community than any other president, uh, a statement that has been debunked. Yeah, and right now, Donald Trump is getting about 8% of the vote, black vote, Don, uh, Joe Biden about 87%. A lot of talk about the economy as well, David Muir, including in Don Trump Jr.'s speech, uh, where he paraphrased a line from your interview uh, with Joe Biden the other day, talking about shutting down the economy. Which just shows how closely they're watching everything Joe Biden says. He, he hasn't traveled much from his home, and when he does and sits down for an interview, ours was the first. The, the question, though, for Joe Biden, when, when I asked him was, if elected and the scientists tell you should COVID combine with the flu, which they said is a real possibility, would you shut the country down again? And he said, if the scientists told me I had to, I would. But he did go on to say that was the fundamental flaw he believes in the Trump administration's response to this pandemic is that they didn't take action with masks and in shutting down the country quickly enough. Uh, he was making the point that in, it's his belief the country and the economy would be doing much better by now already had the Trump administration uh, been tougher. But this is the fundamental challenge uh, for the Trump administration. We have 175,000 American lives lost now, 30 million Americans on unemployment. Don Jr. also acknowledged we still have work to do, but that was it. That was the line before he pivoted and turned to Joe Biden and those words from that interview. And the economic fallout of the crisis as well. Rahm Emanuel, one line we've heard consistently uh, in the speeches all through the evening and from President Trump as well, that but before the pandemic, it was the greatest economy ever in recent history. A lot of Democrats dispute that. Rendezvous with record. Uh, Bill Clinton created 23 million jobs, record amount of people lifted out of poverty, and record amount of small business creation. Pure facts. People know that. I do want to say one other thing about uh, Senator Scott's speech. It stands out as a powerful speech because it was expansive and inclusive in its nature. Everything prior to that was all based all the time, 24 hours, and that's what made, that was a very good speech. He delivered a good speech that was expansive and inclusive. If they stated that message, which hasn't happened to date uh, with all the other prior speakers, you're going to have a powerful piece. And it was beyond the base. That was the first time. And I think it's the contrast was so stark, it's made it a good speech. Sarah Fagan, they gave him that prime slot. It was a good thing. I'm glad they did it. Uh, we need to see more out of uh, him at this convention and, and more of that message at this convention. You know, I think one of the challenges I've had with this evening is the focus on law enforcement. I think it's right to put a nod to law enforcement. I think it's right to call out the lunacy, in my mind, of defunding the police. But there was a lot of it. And I'm not certain that's where America is right now. Yes, Americans want a strong police force in their local community. They want a fair police force. They want better race relations. I don't think it's the issue they're most focused on. They're focused on COVID-19. They're focused on pocketbook issues. And we need to do better on those issues in the coming nights. And let me bring that to Chris Christie as well. And, and, and Chris, does this, and we're seeing a lot of this in all the speeches as well, does this uh, attacking Joe Biden as basically a prisoner of socialism work against Joe Biden He's not Bernie Sanders. It could. And the reason it could, George, is because you can see what's the evolution of Joe Biden over the course of the primary campaign. And I bring up again the raising of the hands on the decriminalizing of the border, um, his move towards Green New Deal, his move towards a lot of the issues. But he um, defeated the socialists in the primaries. George, you say defeated. Some might say capitulated. I mean, you know, in a large measure, he's done that. And I think, I would say one other thing about Tim Scott tonight. He did give a very good speech tonight. Um, he is a future star of this party. Um, and let us remember, when we keep saying Tim Scott's the only black Republican in the Senate, um, there are only two black Democrats in the Senate, Cory Booker and Kamala Harris. And so, so yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. congratulations. Hey, I just that. want to do the that math for you. That is all the time we have right now. Melania Trump is going to be up tomorrow night. We're going to go to our regular program right now for many of that's late local news and I'll see you tomorrow on GMA. With so much...
evening, everybody. We're joined now by Chris Christie, the former governor of New Jersey, Rahm Emanuel, the former mayor of Chicago, ABC News contributor Yvette Simpson, and Republican strategist Sarah Fagan. Speakers tonight painted a dark picture if Biden is elected. You had the McCloskeys, the St. Louis couple who pointed guns at Black Lives Matter protesters outside of their home, warning of riots and lawlessness coming to the suburbs. Conservative activist Charlie Kirk said that Trump was elected to protect the American way of life and is the defender of Western civilization. Don Jr. said the people of faith are under attack by Democrats. There was a lot of playing to the base. Do you think that this was an effective strategy for opening night, Governor? Uh, no, I think the most effective speech of the night by far was Tim Scott. Um, and, and I think it was effective not only because um, the content that Tim spoke about um, was reaching out to people beyond just the base of our party. But it remained consistent with the principles that the party has stood for for a long time. But most importantly, it was authentic. Tim Scott came across as just who he is, which is a person who got raised in a family that cared about certain values. He said he didn't, wasn't always on a straight line up, talked about failing out of school, um, focusing on the wrong things, but that he came back and has now built himself up to be a United States Senator from South Carolina. That's the kind of hopeful thing you want to hear in this, in this campaign, along with those principles that he talked about that he thinks President Trump will stand for and Joe Biden won't. So I think he was by far, it was a great way to end the night. You want to end strong, end it strong with Tim Scott, some of the earlier stuff I could have done without. Ron, this is a moment that you agree with the governor? <laughs> Uh, do we have to do that on yes. TV? Yes. <laughs> so I, would, I would say this. The, Tim Scott stood out because everybody else was carnage, rant, and rage. And it was all base talk, and that's all it did. Tim Scott would try to make the party go beyond the base to a more inclusive and expansive uh, note. And it stood out, and it was a great speech in and of itself, but because everything else preceding it was so narrow cast. And I, what I find interesting about this whole thing is everything they're talking about is actually happening right now under Donald Trump. Crime in the streets, Donald Trump is the president of the United States. Rage and violence that's happening, Donald Trump. The loss of jobs, Donald Trump. So it's not like some future they're painting. It's the actual reality right now under Donald Trump, which is why his reelection is in such trouble. Senator Tim Scott criticized Joe Biden for some of his words about the black community and for his policies. You didn't hear much about racial justice tonight, but you certainly did hear a lot about law and order. How are the Republicans addressing this issue differently than the Democrats, Yvette? Um, by not addressing it at all. I mean, Tim Scott didn't talk about why so many black people don't support the person that he, he supports because he doesn't want to acknowledge the amount of hate and the amount of racist division that Trump has engendered, the things that he says out of his own mouth, the things that people around him say that he encourages and boldens. Tim Scott's not talking about what's happening in Wisconsin. He's not talking about the death of black men at the hand of police officers. And so I would love to live in Tim Scott's world where you can go from cotton to Congress, but there's a lot of black people who are being shot in the streets who do not have that experience. And so if it was the Republicans' objective to get more black people into the tent, I don't think he did that. It, Trump, of course, won four years ago as a change agent. How do you think that he effectively uh, pivots as in the incumbent at this point, Sarah? Well, he needs to lay out an agenda for the next four years. And so we'll, we'll hear that Thursday night. And I hope for the sake of his election and the party that he does that. Um, but here's a thing that I think is often underreported about Trump. We get very focused on the persona of Trump. And it, it, he has at times said divisive things. He gets on Twitter and vents his emotion. There's a flip side to that personality, which is he's also a bulldozer. And when he wants to get something done, he gets it done. I've worked in Republican campaigns for two decades. And people put in the platform, oh, we're going to move the Capitol uh, to Jerusalem in, in the state of Israel. And they never really meant it. He went and did it. And time and time again, from economic policy to foreign policy, he has a way about him where that personality, uh, maybe sometimes people don't like what he says because he's so blunt and direct, but he has a way of getting what he wants done. And he should talk more about the things he's been successful at. It can be difficult, of course, to oust the income that the last person to do that was Bill Clinton. Rom, if you were advising Biden, how would you have him exploit what many might perceive as Trump's biggest challenge or weakness, the coronavirus? 
Well, I think they've done, they started it last week and they've done it before by making it a referendum on both how they've handled the public health, how they've lack of administration and the consequence to your life intimately job, health care, and in the middle of a major health, public health care crisis, he's in front of the Supreme Court trying to tell your health care away. Now, I really do believe, in the end of the day, when a president's running for re-election, pull everything aside, the personalities, the moment in time, the economy, do you want to stay this course, or do you want to get off this road on another road? In the end of the day, it's either stay or change. And right now, whether it's a COVID, the economy or other things going on in society, nothing calls for four more years of the same. They're trying to get people to look through the rearview mirror as if it's a projection forward. Look what we did before COVID came here. I don't think a retrospective election is going to work. And I came up under Bill Clinton, whose motto was, don't stop thinking about tomorrow. America is about the future. And this retrospective look is not helpful to what they're the case they're trying to make. I think also one of the other good moments of the evening besides Tim Scott's speech was early on, there was this video about all these Americans coming together to produce PPE. You saw uh, shots and images of GE workers uh, building ventilators. It was all about Trump talking all about America and the Americans who've come together to help their fellow citizens who are suffering from this disease. We need to see more of that. I'd say, Lindsay, retrospective um, discussion is only important in an incumbent's race in that it validates his future promises. And so when he says, we have all these folks unemployed, I'm going to build the economy back again, people are more likely to believe that because they saw what he did in the first part of his term pre-COVID. And when we talked about racial justice tonight, this was the president that got um, criminal justice reform and a big step towards criminal justice reform done. And that is going to disproportionately um, impact um, folks who have been in prison uh, and are going to get out of prison earlier now or avoid prison altogether um, because of those reforms. Okay. So the retrospective nature okay. of this is important when he makes future promises but on Thursday night. Right now, the retrospective is being done. Give him credit, not for the perspective that he has credibility well, for the future. No. I don't disagree that's with the you. Right. That, They're missing just, the, there's no, there's no, the next sentence. No, and that's what I'm saying. This retrospective portion of it is right, only going to be valuable to him. Chris, I cannot yeah, agree. You guys agree. It's, it's, it's <laughs> only going to be valuable to him <laughs> on Thursday night if he does what Sarah talked about and I've talked about before, which is lay out your vision for the next four years. Then the retrospectroscope can be helpful in validating the, those promises. If he doesn't do that, then we're having a looking back election. That's not good for an incumbent. If you were to send President Trump another memo, oh. uh, <laughs> we'll see if he, if he uses it or not. But what would be your advice as far as how he reaches beyond the, ba the base? Um, you've got to talk about bigger things for the country that you want to help make happen over the next four years. That's the way to do it, Lindsay. It, f elections are always about tomorrow. Rahm is right. They're always about the future. They're not about the past. And if he doesn't make that point, he's going to have a problem. A referendum. <laughs> That is it for us tonight. Thank you so much for joining our first night of coverage of the Republican Convention. We'll be right back here tomorrow starting at 7 p.m. Have a good night.